Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another brand new day of the ALGS. It is year four and it is day three, which means it's the end of the beginning. We started this season just last weekend and we've already had a chance, including today's performances, to see each of our three groups go head to head. But it means that that is the only chance you have to start out in front of the pack. And those who start waddling behind too early they can have some problems heading into championship season, or at least the start of our lands. But today gives some hope, maybe some fear and trepidation, and maybe some just a chance to do enough to put themselves at the top of the leaderboards. My name is Rain Day. Welcome back to another fantastic day. I've got a great crew with me today as well, who is going to bring you all of the action starting in EMEA and ending in North America. Let's introduce the first. It's her first show of this year of the ALGS. She's back off her offseason. It's Vicky Kitty. I'm so Kitty. happy to be back, man. Finally, I am away from the offseason, and I'm here to join the rest of the crew for ALGS year four. It's been way too long. I've been anticipating this time for the last mm. two weeks. Been doing some watch parties, been seeing all all the action's been seeing you guys pop off, and I'm so happy to finally be alongside you, Rain Day, as well as the rest of the crew. Oh, thank you so much, Vicky. And honestly, it's great to have you back. And another person who's gone back to back. Yesterday's show was fantastic with him on board. Now, joining us again on Sunday, it's Dia. Great to have just you back in my presence, man. It's been too long. Thank you so much, Randy. It is a pleasure <laughs> to hear your voice again as uh, ever since week one, which was a fantastic start. So much has already seemed to change in the pro scene. And now finishing the first round, Robin, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Well, we have so much uh, that is going to unfold here again. And, and obviously, we've had a lot that's transpired. So let's take a look for those just catching up with us. What has happened overall? Where do we stand across the board after two days of play going into our third? We have our overall standings coming up here. And Vicky, walk us through your thoughts on our top performing teams, because there have been teams who have definitely proven that they not only are here to play and win for that split championship or that split playoff win, but also just in the split league right now coming in, they're, they're wanting to perform. Yeah, if you take a look at the first 10 teams that we have in the overall standings here in EMEA, there's some team names that may be missing out. And, you, you know, it could be a little surprising, but yeah. that's what today is for, to see if these teams could rise up. But notably speaking of teams like 07, who have had a that's, very consistent yeah. first two days, we were able to see them get fourth in day one, get third in day two, and not mm -hmm. only take these dubs consistently, but also ending a lot of their games with very high KP. And, you know, I mean, you, you bring up 07. Obviously, we also saw, you know, teams like Aurora have such a fantastic game yesterday that we're catapulting and not only into the front, that's put them in kind of a driver's seat as well, Vicky, in that kind of top space. Yeah, it's beautiful to see what Aurora has been able to do. And also, Aurora's always been one of those teams where they will run a different comp than everybody else in the lobby. But something we have been seeing, and actually across different regions too, is the inclusion of the Bloodhound. And that is, mm. you know, by definition, when you see everyone on the Bangalore, if you want to be able to run that Bloodhound, <laughs> and if it works out for you and getting your information, or if you want to get your pigeon to tell you where all the other teams are in the middle of some of your rotates, it could come in handy as well as actually scanning the survey beacons to know where everybody is in the lobby too, midway through that rotation while also changing your own game plan if you want to play more by the edge. It's a great point. If you just heard that, yes, that is a meta character. Dia, I want to get your thoughts now on our participating teams because, you know, you might have been able to give us some attention on some teams that maybe aren't necessarily the Auroras, right, but have a chance to perform here. Some teams you're keeping your eye on. What stands out to you in Group B versus C, a team that's maybe got to perform today or someone you're at least tracking closely? I'm, I'm excited to see Group B retake this stage, and uh, for those of you who have been watching since International Lands, be it Split 2 playoffs of Year 3, or even the Championship, you'll recognize some of these names not from EMEA, but from South America. The teams at the very top of Group B, Aftermath, and at the bottom, Vamo Carrier, have both South American players on them. We, we've got Kings, of course, as well as Kurev and Stalizi, who have all come over from South America. And uh, that's a really exciting thing to me because we get to see regions mix outside of the regular season from year three. Now we're seeing can talent from one region migrate to another, succeed under different IGLs in totally different circumstances. 
Oh, yeah, these are one great of the points. teams, too, that I get to see, Rain Day, actually, is Phoenix Legacy being one of the squads that I cannot wait to see perform again for today. Sabs, Alpha Draft, Kiri right here, or rather Kyrie, she's really good at being the inclusion of this squad after Sabs and Alpha Draft have already built up that synergy in the past. Actually, Kyrie is a big advocate in getting a bunch of women into the Tier 3 competitive Apex scene, which has been fantastic to see now her inclusion in the Pro League, aside from the fact that this is the first time I believe that we see two women competing on one pro league team across a gauntlet of a lobby i mean gauntlet of a lobby that that is a great way to describe this and and the stakes are still high i mean we kind of start off day one's exciting day two we're seeing who's who's sticking but now day three every team will have had a chance to have a go and so it's kind of do or die to see where do you really stand in the first uh 30 percent of our league here but let's start with you vicky i mean there has to be a few teams at least maybe one team that you've got your eye on in particular today that you're expecting a performance from I think I've mentioned them quite a bit already, but it's because after their performance yesterday, what is there not to highlight? I got to talk about Aurora out here after an insane game number three where Hardecki not only claimed the title as MVP for the day in Amia, but he came in clutch, literally being able to res in such a knit tight circle where everybody was on the high ground with less than 10 seconds on the clock to get nine impulse in. He was also rocking the wingman, but that's not all they had. They also had a Kraber in their hand. We mentioned the Bloodhound and what that could change for this composition but while they were climbing up here they were not only able to get out of the line of sight of the teams above them but look how much kp they're able to get aside from the hit fire on that nasty craver shot nine impulse came back and right before we were able to say hello we say goodbye after an insane craver shot as people were falling from the sky they were playing off of a beautiful fence line here before they were able to not only get the dub after a pretty rough game for them but so much kp like i said we had two players i believe what yeah like 15 kp another player get 14 and it's the fact that they were able to remain calm and collected while not only getting the res but also getting the dub on top of this as we take a look after them taking the dub and taking a look at some of these stats here we go yeah that's what i was talking about with 15 15 14 aside from the dub that was huge that elevated them in the overall standings and not only that that set them up nice for world's edge and now, when you when you look at it, I mean, uh, coming back to Adia, obviously there's so much to talk about Aurora. We could probably spend most of the day, I'm sure, during our cast, we'll be talking about them meticulously. But in terms of overall pictures as well, who who do you have your eye on as far as a team coming into this lobby? Yeah, it's difficult because Aurora did put on a big performance, but uh, I'm looking back at another team that I think is going to be on a lot of people's minds coming into today, Orglis and Hungry, who mm. placed third in their first match day of the ALGS season. This is, of course, a roster that has some names you'll be familiar with from Vexed days that were honestly on Vexed, taking EMEA by storm in year three. They've got Matape and Unlucky, and have put Kinda in with this roster, who made their debut as a cracked fragger on E6, and has now transitioned to a sort of anchor role with Orglis and Hungry, sitting back and playing on Catalyst, providing support to people like Unlucky on Horizon, and of course Matafe, who has been playing the Conduit. This is not one of the teams that we see running Bloodhound, instead preferring the constant uptime that something like a Conduit will give them, and Matafe specifically has been really excellent not just about IGLing his team to victory as so frequently has happened <laughs> on the EMEA stage but with navigating this new legend's ability to impact fights They've got, he's got the most kills for a reason and looking a little bit further down kind of as the stabilizing force for this team is so often not just finishing the fight but getting his team back in it for the next one really a fantastic squad and again going through something that was surprising the start of our pro league last week two days before they were no longer a part of the org that they've been uh, representing most of their tenure here here in the algs so that's got to be something that they had to work through maybe not emotionally as much because they did add a new player it wasn't a part of that history but certainly matafe going how am I leading this squad? All right, we're just going to go out there and do the absolute best that we can. And I like that. I think they've got a lot of fans. We'll see if that continues for their performance today, and they'll be happy after six games. But 
another team that really has to do something. They, we would have expected them to be doing a lot more heading into this uh, day one. They, they didn't. It was a kind of a lackluster performance, and they're aware of that. It's Alliance. Hockey's effect in Yuki. Hockey's, he's in that category of IGL where you put some of the greats in Apex, the Sweets, the Hals, the Zeros, but he's not quite been able to get that land championship like many of them, except obviously Hal and Zero. But what he's done is he's led Alliance to be one of the most consistent and dangerous teams, not just online, but at LAN as well. Yet these stats on the right side, pay attention to those. Average placement, less than 10. They're averaging in the bottom half of this lobby, meaning they're getting out early and they're not getting enough kills. They're not getting enough points. They had two good games, but what does that mean over the course of their next four games? They weren't able to pick it up. They weren't able to find that rhythm that we're so used to seeing them have. And I want to kind of talk about how that looks in terms of a new distribution we're adding into some of the stats that we bring to you at the ALGS main broadcast. It's the damage differential. This is basically describing how much damage you're giving versus how much damage you're taking. Meaning if you're in the positives on that upside, you're dealing much more damage than you're actually taking. Alliance. Can you find them yet? I gave you a little bit of time. They're on that middle left side, just barely below neutral. And of course, a team who is a juggernaut of Amiya, one of our main contenders to win championships when we ever, whenever we see them at land, we would expect them to have a much better day going into this second of their potential uh, to play in the start of our season. Hockey's, he was aware of the issues, but he wasn't too worried about him. We actually sat down with him a little bit before the start of day three. Hey guys, Hack is here. Uh, we're playing this weekend on Sunday, and my teammates are Effect, Yuki, and our coach, Noth, and hopefully we'll show up this weekend. Uh, so day one, we got 14th. It wasn't the greatest of starts, but however, I think it was good because now we actually got a real wake-up call. Um, ALDS is not like scrims. It is not like all third-party tournaments. It is a completely different play style, and everybody plays much better and much more serious, so... Hopefully it was just a wake-up call and we can get it together for next week. I don't really think about it that much. Uh, for me, Europe is just a stepping stone to LAN. It is just something we use to qualify and at LAN is all that matters. So all our preparations and all our performance just goes towards that and hoping to win LAN. That's all that I'm playing for. You know, Dia, if you look at any, you know, great time of stress, when you look to a leader, you want someone who's measured, who thinks big picture and not gets overly upset or overly happy and eager about a positive or negative performance. It feels like hockey's is kind of keeping that mentality. That's very true. And it, he always has been the very stable emotional presence. Y Yuki as well is actually a yeah. very chilled out person. And it's nice to see them experimenting with a few things early on in the season. And I think, Randy, that's where I'm approaching this from. Well, Alliance may have not had the results that a lot of fans would expect from their first match day. Their lack of concern is inspiring confidence in me, and we're just trying a few new things. And I would tell you, a team that already has the tools that you don't need to give emotional uh, motivation is Alliance, that's for sure. You want them to kind of just feel like they're safe and then surprise them. But Vicky, let's go back to kind of the overall standings again, really set the stage for today before we get into our matches, which are coming up in just a moment. Walk me through our top 10 teams so far in EMEA. Well, I've mentioned it before, but 07's consistency has uh, definitely allowed them to sit in that number one spot in the overall standing so far after their first two days. They had gotten fourth day number one, they got third day number two, but not only just that, they had a great performance on Storm Point, I believe, for both of those days. And still, while occurring all the KP that they needed, E6 definitely being another team to look at. Two rats, one controller. I wasn't surprised there to see where they were standing at the end of those two days as well. Awara, of course, after their performance, yesterday their first time of them playing so far in the pro league for day number two they were also able to secure themselves in that top five spot but you talk about alliance and mm. i'm surprised to not see them here in the top 10 while we take a look at that second page dia yeah, this is where you're going to see a lot of teams that have only played one match day because that's the really important number in the second column. Mind well, technically in 11th right now, the fact that they're tied for stay healthy means that by the end of today, they're going to be bumped down. Teams like Vex, LVH, No Days Off, and especially Phoenix Legacy, who I've really got my eye on today, should be jumping up the leaderboard and I'd expect them to land in the top 10. When we look a little further down the list though, Rain Day, this is where things get a lot more dire. 
Yeah, a, a lot of these teams, I mean, you, you even look at some old contenders here, the Forge, you know, led by Phoenix, Jay Savage. These guys have been playing and nearly qualifying every single land, but have not been able to do it and found themselves there through either substitutes from teams not being able to go, Aurora Fire Beavers earlier on in Split 2, or simply as subs for teams who needed other players. These are the types of teams, Vamo Carrera with Ascend as well, excuse me, Kashera off Ascend with a new squad, can they do enough to start off strong? We mentioned it's the end of the beginning and starting a race is very, very important. It's not necessarily how you finish, but first impressions, they mean a lot. And I think right now, this is the final chance to give us all a first impression, viewers at home, all of us watching and all of us obviously commentating of where you really stand in the power rankings and the ALGS, not just in EMEA, but overall. We're gonna find more answers to that as they play because that's the only way to decide this thing for real so as uh we just start, started with the top of the show let's get into the main action of the games i'm going to leave it over to you vicky and dia to kick us off here in day three Thank you so much, Rain Day. I'm here with Dia, and Dia, it's finally happening. We are finally here together to kickstart year four, day number three. I was waiting in the rains, and I couldn't wait to dive in as you guys have been able to take a look and check out for both of me and NA. Our map rotation has remained the same here. For the first three matches, we'll be taking a trip over to Storm Point before making the transition into World's Edge for our final three games. And Vicky, I've really been enjoying the fact that we start on Storm Point and give our teams a chance to quite literally expand, take up a lot of space. Storm Point is a massive map with so much open area that is beneficial to control, as opposed to World's Edge, where you really are rewarded for playing quite small, playing in buildings. Storm Point gives you a chance to play the opposite side of that, and it's a skill set that actually transfers really well from our starting matches into our closing ones on World's Edge. As we start dropping in, we do have a few contests to keep our eyes on. On. Lightning Rod especially is going to be pivotal for all these three games. I can't wait to see how that plays out here. I believe Lightning Rod would be the boys versus Alliance. And you talk about how pivotal it would be. I mean, we highlighted Alliance for a reason in our pre-show. Now we get to see how they get to perform and start off their day for game number one. It's all about that momentum. And talk about 50-50s. We're taking a trip over to the mill too. It's a great place to start one, especially with all the bins in the center. Made in Heaven splits off quickly from Aftermath. Made in Heaven had such a great day yesterday, but it wasn't the early 3v3s that made them impressive. It was their late game control of other teams. Interesting, too. This is where Made in Heaven usually lands here. So Aftermath taking a 50-50 and starting off beautifully with a purple evil on the other side. Nice angles, even with double revolt and lackluster energy ammo off the rip. You could tell that they chose violence the moment that they landed here. They were able to also get the evil shield advantage when they were able to land on those beams, uh, those bins first. As you can take a look, though, right behind them, you have to try to close out this fight quickly or a third party could be inevitable this early on. Especially with the Conduit Tactical already ticking down, Kura will lose the temporary shields soon, and I, I'll be honest, Made in Heaven don't seem nearly as interested in fighting this as Aftermath do, who are chasing them from building to building, and yet not actually finding purchase to finish them off. Made in Heaven now have a defensive perimeter set up on the inside, and as always in mill, especially off of contests, a third party is a danger should this fight extend too long. Yeah, let's not forget Aurora lands and splits some loot by North Cenote as well as that uh, armory that's right there next to Mill. So if they really see what's going on here, they could try to involve themselves as the fight progresses. Aftermath, though, with the reset, now playing off that low ground, trying to find two different angles here. I love the distraction as they try to focus fire from both angles. Aftermath have the advantage with Curve going down first. Stall has that rampage with only 18 bullets left here. They were able to get two knocks on the other side only leaving one. It is two players of uh, Aftermath still left standing, and with the last chase on Synetic, oh. the Trident should not help you as you still take damage through that, even a shot from the distance as Exo Clan from Down to Beast was paying attention. Aftermath do very well to win the fight, a fight that they were trying to start for quite a long time and finally get some purchase in, but it is a late portion of the game for them, especially when the ring is pulling over to you. And it is. Go Next have already arrived in the area. And while they may not be third partying the fight, this isn't going to give Aftermath a whole lot of room to move or loot before they have to bunker down for the end game. 
and try to see where all the other teams are going to be rotating. Like you mentioned, since this is going to be in that next circle, you have to imagine the two buildings right over to the side of Mill having that survey beacon to allow any teams that may be running a comp that could allow them to get the scan. They could also be playing for inside the building. The catwall has been called up. And in the distance, you could also see Phoenix Legacy in the back of the forge right there in front of them. As stay healthy tries to fight for this building. No one's going to try to overextend here, but definitely expect those choke points by Cedo and by that North side exiting out of checkpoint to get contested very soon as you can see actually right here the other teams that are now involving themselves over by mill aurora actually still taking their time here in cenote have no reason to try to overextend while they hear all the fighting happening while also sticking to playing more by the edge cold are just starting to move in through Cito station as well but it's a late enough point in the game that those teams that are interested in playing in the center of the ring should already be doing so. Cold are likely to try and maintain this ridge line instead, perhaps fighting teams like Aurora later, where the rest of this map starts to become about small little poke battles between, say, Mill, the surrounding buildings, and even, as we said, ExoClan by Down Beast, who will eventually get involved. I think it's so interesting to see how this pick rate for our first match is going. 90% Bangalore, by the way, as we take a look at Phoenix Legacy, losing out on Kyrie as the first pick. That's going to be Sonya having that rampage in close quarters be a little deadly, especially if you had a charge up prior. You aim now, trying to navigate around these nades, around that thermite. Sonya in a little bit of trouble, but this is where the conduit comes into play to allow these close quarter fights to prolong even longer in Ewing's favor. Phoenix Legacy is the second team to get eliminated in this lobby. An unfortunate timing for them as well. A unusually late rotation from Phoenix Legacy, especially to a POI so close to them, leaves them ultimately in 19th place. No points for this game, but it is just the first one, Vicky, and there will be plenty more time for them to change that in the games to come. But the moment Aftermath, who, as we said, did need to bunker down, have done so remarkably with plenty of loot to go, will ESG still try and make their way into Mill? And this is, this is the don't pull up zone right here. And with the new inclusion of Cedo Station, you already know that there's going to be chaos happening over here while ESG are going to look to reposition. And it's because of that ring console that you see as well at Cenote. So a lot of teams want to rotate through this choke if they could get that ring circle information, especially with the pick rate that we currently saw on Catalyst. It's insane to see alongside with Bangalore. Not much has changed leaving out of champs when you take a look at those two legends, despite some changes that each legend has been going through themselves. Now as we take a look over to that north side, so many of these other squads already making the rotate away from North Pad. I know that was Vex that's still taking their time over there while LVH now making their way over to Pylon. They don't have any squads in front of them, but they do have a replicator coming up on this POI in case they need any more meds or if they want to craft up a purple, if they have enough of those crafting materials right there, which doesn't look like Jay Hanzo has at the moment. Not yet, but honestly, having the crafting is going to be such a godsend, especially in a time in Apex Legends where we are seeing the 30-30 all the time, and the crafting today with the sniper stock and skull piercer should make the 30-30 <laughs> even better. We even already got one for LVH, and that's before they even hit this crafter, so they're going to be juiced up by the time they leave Pylon, which honestly is what the POI is good for. Landing pylon, rotating through pylon, it all seems to go well. I'm so glad you brought up what's in the replicator because also because today is Sunday, we're going to also have the purple knockdown and the Moby respawn beacon coming into play. So that's all going to be interesting considering that Conduit has made her way into the meta after her release. Taking a look at this beautiful overhead here, you can see how many teams have congested inside of the mill. Exo still taking their time to rotate by that north side of the circle, leaving down beast. But it's that choke that Forge may find themselves pinched in. Oh, stay healthy is not going to be going anywhere after they've secured themselves in that side building by mill they could still do some poke damage onto forge if they do not get out of their line of sight well vamos querer is over to the other north side also taking their time in those buildings south of checkpoint this whole area is going to be so difficult to get out of, though, and that's what's a bit confusing about prioritizing this early. We do still have a few minutes where teams can make their way out through each side, the, even the north and west and eastern sides of Checkpoint. But once the ring closes, perhaps not this zone, but the next, the only choice that you have is going to, leave, is going to be to leave through that Forge Choke 
And it's a promise of eliminating multiple teams. I'd like to see teams like Vamoquera start to relocate, as well as St. Lucie de France, who were most recently spotted in height at checkpoint. More of these teams making the rotate here. Aurora looking fantastic in terms of those Evo Shields, but this is still a team that has not left this POA. They have taken their time, but it goes into their game plan, running the comp that they're currently running. We highlighted it in the pre-show, but with that Bloodhound, the Bangalore, and the Horizon, they're choosing a much more aggressive approach versus what's been the most recent conversation on Conduit versus Horizon being that main pick for these teams to excel in. And with the Catalyst still being one of those mainstay pieces that wall provides so much flexibility when it comes to making those rotates on top of the smokes that your team could be running here digi in the hands of psychop just trying to take a peek right over the gravity cannon they know there's a team right there in the distance by those rocks but do they want to take this fight here with so many other squads still by the checkpoint by rather the, ch the choke by checkpoint that they could go in for a third party here if they do decide to take this fight against exo LCD, LCDF's 3v3s in yesterday's games were absolutely on point, but it was in the late game rotations where they were really suffering, not taking 3v3s and instead finding themselves accidentally in 3v6s. A position like this, where they're in an isolated fight against Exo Clan, it looks good for them. And things are looking good for Alliance as well, who have just picked up a single kill, but that's a point. That's a single point for them. And that's what's really important for Alliance today is that they can continue to slowly build up momentum. That's how it starts, especially for game number one here. It's finding the footing for where these teams want to situate themselves in the overall leaderboards here as XO in that fight, looking to their backs to make sure that squad right behind them, De France, doesn't take advantage of this pinch situation. There's a very rough rotate with so much open air. You can already see the smoke nades coming out from Bavis. Young Hong Kong trying to get away. He is literally one shot, is able to get into some cover underneath this bridge where they could take a little bit of a breather. Alliance finish off the rest of 202 in that time. And you'll remember that right behind Exo, we had Lacite de France who move up and clean up Aurora. Now, though, with this rotate and knowing where that next circle is going to be, because they were able to get that circle scan earlier by Down Beast, they're seeing where that circle is going to be pulling and the fact that they don't really have a lot of space to work with. With Aftermath being on the edge of Mill and Exo getting ahead of them on the rotate, they've already claimed underneath that bridge space. You can actually see the ping coming in to see where they could find themselves for some natural cover by these rocks. So that's really all they have to work with while we take a nice look at the overhead of the squads that are making their rotate with the circle coming in. The slow side of the ring, though, with LCDF and Aftermath is by far in the minority of what we're seeing throughout the rest of Stormpoint. Most of the traffic we're getting is out towards the eastern side, whether it be coming out of Checkpoint with the Forge and Vamo Carrier, or as Alliance are currently preparing to do, coming in through the eastern with them having to fight. Remember, we saw Cold up on the ridge line, and we're seeing Orglis and Hungry in the area as well. ESG now sit up on the ridge that we saw Cold at earlier. This is going to be where the big fights happen because everyone will be out in the open upon this next zone close. And with ESG also being on the hilltop, you have to consider the teams from Cedo that are going to be rotating in this direction. Will they find themselves pinch, or will they be able to force ESG to split that focus onto them while the squads to their south side end up getting a free rotate like Alliance that we see right here now trying to take to the Evans with the Prowler in hand for Hockeys. This is where they have to make the action happen, but this is a good spot for them to hold for right now before they're forced off in the next 10 seconds just to see if they can hold that lip of Pride Rock and take advantage of the squads that are going to be making that desperate rotate from that south side by the armored cold in this fight, though, losing out on JMW. Graceful, having oh. to be careful he can't get into cover as cold is your squad to get eliminated in 15th. And you've got to question the call from Cold giving up high ground so easily without a fight to Alliance and walking immediately into their deaths at Mill. The decision does not go well. And Alliance are the ones that, upon even attempting to third party that, realize very much that it's much better to hold on to the high ground that previously Cold had wow. dominated. They return and Hackis starts the fight off well with a defensive cat wall down. In fact, is going to be left to clean up the majority of this. Hackis is down. Yuki just now getting the regen. Comes in to support his comrade. Gets a nice shot on the top. And with effect 
cleaning up a few kills. We've got a third party that makes short work of both teams. Oh, that's Vamokere taking advantage of the situation. And with this composition, one of the very rare teams to still be rocking the Valkyrie, by the way. Watson still here as they try to lock down this high ground, but that's extra KP that they are absolutely happy with. It's very surprising with the start of that fight. Alliance looked very confident there, but unfortunately, even with the Prowler, Hakis was not able to take advantage. The two players that were incredibly low there, Lucita Fonts, another team that seems to be in some trouble. They were able to get that res for right now. Now, while well, Kanan able to take some morning shots at the team that is looking for the opportunity to take advantage of their situation. Exo would really like to get a little bit of vengeance for what happened earlier as we got Alliance. What? What? Thank you. Thank you. Already taken out with LVH taking a quick reset. Vamos querer, however, do continue their rampage from earlier after taking a third party against Alliance, move in to finish off LVH. And now again, retake this ridge line. They are very far from where the rest of the map is playing out, but man, are they collecting the KP to make that just fine. Absolutely, especially with their slower approach in the beginning. Let's see their fonts. Can't really say the same. They wanted to take a fight originally like we had seen against Exo. Now putting themselves over here by Mill, falling incredibly low while they do lose out on their cat once again. Now having to play this patiently to try to reset. You see Psychop, he's got one med kit left, having to navigate it away as a Thermite is tossed right at the door to destroy it. Door right in front of Hidan is incredibly low too, almost broken. But this is the amount of teams that are sharing this mill space. We got three teams in general. Aftermath, the seek their fonts as a duo. You aim on the other side of the building. Safe away from all the other teams that are gonna be rotating on the outskirts of this, specifically the two buildings that we know that are off to the east from mill. This game is going so fantastically for Aftermath. I I cannot help but be happy for them, especially as we mentioned, with their South American pickups, our questions about whether these this interregional now talent would be able to execute coming into today's match day is being answered in our first game alone. Aftermath have dominated Mill. They've had no loot outside of it and have simply sat here and farmed teams that try and encroach on their territory. Territory. LCDF are in tatters sharing space with them and stay healthy. We'll soon have to join that very same squad that they're fighting in trying to move up and fight Aftermath as well as the other teams in Mill for their territory. But do they have the time to do so? They put up the cat while they're incredibly low from that previous fight. They won't be able to reset with the circle closing in right behind them. Let's see if their fonts Vex also get eliminated in your feeds while stay healthy with Urban staying alive manages to try to get this reset here by the fence line. This is the power of the smoke nades. Even if that catwall doesn't fully cover that corner, Go Next can't really look at them from this direction, especially in the positioning that they're in with the crate being right in front of them. You can see that they're able to try to get that reset. That wall going down, though, is going to add some extra pressure underneath them. Vamos Querer are taking such a long time to rotate into ring that from the east, they are putting down so much pressure onto teams like Stay Healthy, onto Go Next, who, as you mentioned, may not have the best sight lines now and certainly don't have the best rotation in, sandwiched between Stay Healthy and Exo Clan, with now Vamos Querer starting to move into the high ground and taking over Mill. In the meantime, our Kings of Mill aftermath have been taken down by none other than Uaim, who now holds hold one of the best positions and almost assured second place. Even if they could get on the high ground too. I honestly have also really loved that rotation from Vamo and where they've been so far. Go next, take this fight. The Arc Star, though, clipping on top of somebody getting that stick. What a huge double off the Arc. Go next needed that with the other team being in the distance, trying to take some shots at them. Don't think they will be able to reset here. It'd be incredible if they could. And Kashira cleans up what was left of that last straggler from Go next. Vamo now just as an equally good spot right here alongside the team sharing this part with Mill, but now they've also been able to take to the high ground while Kings is holding on to a prowler. Vamokadeh, remember, have cleaned up a lot of KP on the way in here as well. So even with their spot being one where they could get first, they do not have to play for first. A second place with plenty of kills would put them far above many other first place teams in terms of the points. From the low ground, one remaining member of Infinite starts to creep their way in, but this should, at the end of the match, be a 3v3 between Vamokadeh and Yuan. 
And Baba could have needed this here too. They were also one of the teams that had a lackluster performance in that first day. They're looking to put themselves on top with this composition here. You could already see Sens getting set up here. Kashira over to the other side. But they're going to be bunkering down right now in less than a minute with this final circle closing into their backs. The final three squads remaining here as they find that one straggler from Infinite over to their side. They're not going to give up this space, though. Not going to put themselves in a vulnerable situation right in front of UA while they also hold cover. And, it, and it's a terrifying battle because UAIM have taken out so many squads as well. Last, but certainly not least, has been Aftermath, who owned Mill from the beginning of the match. UAIM can really claim the crown in Mill, can dominate Vamo Carrer, who have been terrorizing the eastern side of the zone, or we could see Vamo Carrer start to rear their heads as well. It's really crazy, too, because Vamo Carrera, I believe, lands at wall, and then UAM lands in barometer. So with that barometer rotate, it is slightly easier for UAM to stay here, and that's why they've been fighting off every other team that tries to go into their space, while Vamo Carrera has been taking their time with the rotate, where they'll be going right through checkpoint, up and around, closer to Cedo Station from the south side of Beam, and now being able to hold on to this high ground, both Kashera and Sonya on the opposite end from UAM have been able to do so well in getting the KP that they need. Smoke's the most important cooldown for VQ here. Because they don't have things like a catalyst wall that gets used on the other side to take space, they're operating off of just a Watson to make sure they don't get naded out of position. And of course, the Valkyrie, who at this point in the game is going to honestly offer very little value, perhaps a few off angles, where you aim have so much immediate impact. Here comes the smoke. Already the catalyst wall is out. They've got the refuel on shields from Radiant Transfer. And with Sens down, they have the liberty to use all of that and abuse it to take the win. Kashera is down, Sens is down, one member left for Bravo Carrier, and it is a nice cleanup for you, Abe. Sonya with the 6kp down to the very end, cleaning up the last two members as well. You aim, come out on top, and what a performance, too. They felt pressured to close in the gap right there. Once they put down the cat wall, that's something that Vamo Kered does not have. They do not have a catalyst to work with, so they were just waiting. They would be more than willing to play the waiting game there, being the green light for you aim to know they have to take advantage there. They already put their gap closer in, and now they have to put themselves in reposition to take that fight. I am so curious how this turned out in the points, though, because of the contrasting compositions that we already saw and, and discussed in that last ring. Vamo Carrer just simply didn't have the ordinances, the cooldowns, and most importantly, the abilities, period, to actually fight up against a squad that all three had very active abilities to work with. And so I am curious whether this move from a squad that lands over at wall, that farmed up along the edge of the zone, actually got them more points than a team on the other side, like UAIM, that was constantly looking for close range fights. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how that all played out here. I want to see more about what went down in that last game too, Dia, with the highlights showing us the rotation points, but also our early fights that we were able to see come down to mill right from the very beginning. I, I did feel a little bit bad for Made in Heaven here, especially after having such a good match day just yesterday. Their early eviction from Mill did not do them a lot of favors, especially when the zone is coming over to you. That's when contests can be especially punishing because you know that had you simply won the early fight, you could have easily gotten yourself to a top three, much like we saw Aftermath doing. On the, on the other side of this, of course, we had this big battle that was coming in from the east, and while Checkpoint was certainly crowded, it was a lot of teams that came in from the millage, from the Cenote area, that ended up taking fights much like this one, that ultimately did lead to the death of Alliance, but... We got a little cheeky trying to slide down the hill with so many teams in the area. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was a perfect opportunity to move in for the third party. The catwall basically being that shiny beacon to let these other teams rotating know that they were able to take advantage of the lack of sight and also getting to see Aftermath after they did come out on top from that 50-50. They were counter rotation from the mill and trying to make sure they could stave off any other teams that wanted to approach that north side. We saw a lot of action happening in the building over to the east side of mill while so many of these other teams were fighting for their life with an insane stick on the arc 
star navigating and getting a double here, but it's still in front of so many other teams. Go next, were quickly taken out. It was Vamo Querer on their rotate from the wall over to the other side to find themselves over on the south side of Mill, where they were able to not only look to see where that next circle was going patiently at the start of the game, but then be demons at the very end to get the KP that they needed before they got second. Some really nice damage from Kings, and I'd be hesitant to underestimate Vamokera. This was a fantastic game from them, but not nearly as good as picking up the win for you, Aim. Plenty of damage, of course, is going to come with a composition like this that is meant to get up in your face and to take you down. Look at this out here. We're talking about Sonya coming in with the 6 KP, 1800 damage, but it looks like overall this entire squad is on the same page. You'd love to see it with a great first game. Can they keep up that the momentum? That is the question here. Now, taking a look at the results from our first game, we saw the 50-50 happen in the very beginning. Now, taking a look at UAIM getting 10 KP, finishing with a total of 22 points. Vamos Querer still getting 8 KP there in second place. Looking all the way down even to La Cita Fonts, who we saw were in a little bit of trouble when they wanted to prioritize their rotate to down beast to then get that circle beacon information. Now we know that UA and Vamokira got a lot of kills. They dwarf the rest of the lobby, but the two teams that stand up to them are Aftermath, who led themselves in the top 10, and Alliance, who with six kills still did go out relatively early, but changed their points in the story of today by doing so. They've placed themselves so far above, again, in terms of points, the rest of the bottom 10, that they should still be in contention for even a top five position moving out of this first game. Love to see how all of game one has already played out. I'm excited to see how these next two games play on Stormpoint. That's right, we still have a lot more Stormpoint action coming to you guys soon on the other side of this break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another moment here in game two. About to be whose moment? We'll find out. It's Rain Day and Dia. Last game, we saw you aim and Vamo Carrera battle it out 3v3. I love it. it. You know, put a boxing ring between those two, around those two, and it's just a showdown between who can win a fight. And it was obviously you aim who had the pressure and the poise to just push what little advantage that they had, which was not allowing the advantages of the Watson from, from Vamo Carrera to kind of keep building up forcing them into, uh, you know, a slower play. And and Dia, obviously, that worked really, really well for them. Yeah, we, we talked about how Stormpoint is really a map where you're rewarded for taking as much space as possible. And you even exemplified that by using things like the Catalyst Wall and Bangalore Smokes effectively and obnoxiously, I dare say, in order to make the Watson <laughs> fences just a little bit of a, a, a visual impediment but really nothing else they were nice decorations they didn't end up serving any purpose are we already over the bangalore meta is that what it is people just uh, over the smokes now dia uh i i think that some pros are definitely 
starting to try and try and move on. It's really difficult, though, when Bangalore provides so much value. And it's funny because if you had told me two years ago that Bangalore was going to be meta, I would have laughed in your face. This this is not something that anybody <laughs> expected to happen. But Bangalore has gained so much value in the past year of Apex Legends yeah. as things do become a lot about not just actually fighting, which Bangalore is really good at, but covering you from a distance with the smokes. You know, I think too obviously you know it depends everyone's always in my opinion it's easy to be used to the meta say i want something to change want something to shift you know we have seen horizon and catalyst and bangalore kind of what i call the occlusion meta where there's just a lot of visual occlusion that you're having to play around versus where maybe we had more shielding heavy metas or uh you know defensive metas where we're in buildings we have newcastles or gibraltars or things or watson's heavily running the table i think now it's more about how do you play in open space yet that space is occluded i, I think that bangalore too her stock has risen not only just because the fact that this legend uh this map storm point i think has lent itself to characters who can play in open spaces and, and have uh universal and you 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 know utility solutions for not common problems it's not always a, a clear path of where you have to walk to you but also the fact that there's a lot of legends that have kind of come and gone and bangalore's just a very solid pick she's got pretty much three abilities that are just guaranteed to provide value and things rise and fall she's like that stable choice where it's like hey kind of makes sense to invest in this character we're gonna get something out of it yeah, no, no matter what, whether you are up close and personal, where she can move so much faster, or of course, at a distance, whereas we've talked about the smokes are providing a lot. And that's mm. the rule of thumb that we can use for a lot of the legends that we're seeing just be meta in ALGS right now. When we look at things like Horizon, whether you are playing zone or edge, she's going to be really important for, be for being able to move your team from one place to another. And of course, having somebody like your fragger on a Horizon yeah. means that you have so much more motivation Ability. things like catalyst as well both defensive and offensive great questions and that you raise in terms of you know where do you put the priority of certain legends like horizon we didn't see one being played by vamo career they were going uh you know with uh the choices of the watson the bangalore the conduit these were a lot of defensive shielding focused kind of choices and as we get into game two you know what will be the impact there group movement Horizon brings that almost more than any other legend currently being played in the game right now uh, with that gravity lift. So we'll see if that continues to be a theme. I know uh, that I'm excited to see who steps up. Big theme for me, though, starting off was a team I talked about at the top, Alliance, falling out in 13th place yet again, contributing to that kind of average back half of the lobby placement. You cast that fight uh, with Vicky, it seemed like they were starting off well. Things just didn't go well, and that's kind of the team Vamo Carrere that ended up actually stepping into that place and taking a second place overall. Yeah, and uh, an alliance did seem quite eager to take the fight behind them, and even the one where they were trying to third-party cold initially in front at Mill. I think this is ultimately what caught them a bit off guard, is Alliance's fighting is the thing that's largely changed about their identity between last mm. year and this one, where they are trying to shift up roles a little bit more, and so perhaps in trying to test that, they do overextend a little bit, but with six kills, Rain Day, I'm finding it difficult to fault them entirely, because at least sure. they keep themselves, in terms of points, in the top half of the lot. I think when you get into what works for a game, even if it doesn't go exactly your way, six kills is a perfect number to make sure that you have at least a chance to continue being a threat and maybe figuring some things out. We jump in a little bit late to this fight, but as you can see, the aftermath is pretty clear. Uh, AM Flash finds the kill on the Maiden Heaven Synetic, and that should be at least aftermath taking the lead. It's not a full wipe yet, but this has gone... The second time we've seen this kind of early contest at mill where our game ended and uh you know now aftermath seemed to be having the advantage but check out who's arriving immediately afterwards this time exo clan knowing that there's a contest happening at mill wow do not want to give any time and immediately evac tower over i suppose not hearing shots they are going to retreat and fair enough i wouldn't want to mess with an unknown either but the threat of this is implicit especially when we look at how it'll play out for the third game we know as omniscient viewers that if aftermath and made in heaven goes on for a long time exo are going to be there to put an to it absolutely and now you start to think with you know made in heaven now in in the position where they've split they've got one uh kind of on the southern southeastern side southwestern side excuse me and then one still 
working their way around mill you've got to wonder well we have the 50 50 maybe we just commit to a 50 50 we split our players we don't try to contest and have all of mill because we know what exo clan is going to potentially try to do it's going to be an an inevitable situation and we don't want that type of thing we want to be able to play around it Orglis and hungry looking to play around an introduction here into this fight bolt in hand it's 30 early kind of trying to get some damage and apply some pressure but gets hit right back good thing though the radiant transfer is there to at least buy some time but now he's forced to ult that's a smart wall. Splits Rakafaka off from the rest of 202 and gives them the chance to move into the center of Echo HQ. Now Orglis and Hungry can fight, if not with the high ground, at least with even footing, and are doing so quite well. Dancing around the Thermites, now finally swinging all as a team around this catalyst wall, almost taking down one, but missing out on the damage by just a bit. Defensive gravity lift doesn't come in yet as Unlucky swings again. One knock on Ozzy the Owl, Orglis and Hungry taking a reset. This is unpushable position. Yeah, and now it's just leading to their advantage as well because they've already got one knock. It's going to be impossible to get it down. They three battery at the same time. But look at this on the other side. Phoenix Legacy, Curry, Sabs, Alpha Draft. One of our only teams in Pro League with two female competitors on it. And not only that, just so, so legacy in terms of their experience in the Pro League and in high level Apex Legends. Sabs joining us on the desk uh, for one of our splits last season as well. Incredible confidence in this team. They're 17th right now. Haven't found a point yet, but you could tell the mind. They're ready to take advantage of any of these moments. And I think that this is a team that you got to pay attention to today. I'm expecting a pretty decent performance from. I can't, I can't help but laugh with the way that Phoenix Legacy played that fight. They walk all the way up, start to poke Orglis and Hungry, walk back, and in doing so, have completely turned things around. Now it's Orglis and Hungry that are missing a member, and Phoenix Legacy, without even a point to show for it, walk back into their building and so, yeah, my, do my job is done. I've messed up somebody's day. <laughs> it's a, you know, and that's kind of the funny thing about it. You're not necessarily trying to win that fight. You're trying to make it hard for someone else to survive around you and make them uh, play with a man down, play with a type of handicap so that you put yourself in a position to be more successful as a full three later on in this game. A lot of teams betting that this southern side of the map will be where this game ends, which is why you see so many so far in this cramped area. It doesn't mean, though, that they're all going to be right, but obviously, if you are guessing with them, this is where you would say there's a high chance of it. Still, all these teams poking. Nobody wants to give up too much. Phoenix, Phoenix Legacy sharing that building with Graceful, JMW, and Tyler FPS underneath. And Infinite, and of course, 202 on the outskirts of the north and the west side. Going over to another area, though. Go next. And you can see they're, they're kind of holding this. A, a couple of fights. I mean, seems like teams are pretty timid. 20 squads still left to you after almost a full ring. And being able to craft is so important to these teams that I, I can't help but look at go next and think about basically how they're going to pull it off. Because Pylon is going to be a place that a lot of teams are rotating through. As you've already pointed out, it's not just go next that are here, but having access to getting a few more bats. And as we already discussed today, the, st the stock and the Skull Piercer that can come out of the Crafter mm. at this point in time are so critically valuable, especially when we get end zones that pull over towards open areas like Echo HQ. ESG sitting on 12th place. Blasts, Lufka, Light, Lufka finding his squad here, trying to see a home. And with the Horizon, trying to see a player as well. Doesn't see much yet on the 30-30 with the Ranger Scope at three times. My preferred scope in game as well a lot of players like this one two by four will also work but won't go any farther than that it's a nice little middle ground for a weapon that sometimes can become your last ditch effort with some hit fire to try and seal the deal when you miss a few too many bullets on that smg but big overview here dia what are you seeing as this map does indeed start to pull with these zones you can tell south as phoenix legacy 202 and these squads have predicted I'm keeping an eye on Vamo Carrier, who are just now rotating into ring. Remember, this is a team that was running Valkyrie last game, and that alone has made a big difference in their ability to yeah. get from Pylon into the Devastated Coast so easily. Teams, however, that are not at all interested in being in zone, instead fighting outside of it, have Aftermath visiting Aurora's home territory, and it doesn't look like it's going too well for them. 
It's pretty unbelievable. Somebody had mentioned, I think it was, uh, I know I was referencing it from, I think, Tiff talking about it yesterday. I don't know if one of you harkened back to it today, but 30 seconds on average for a fight. You look at what we have now, though, before this zone really starts to hurt and push. It's a minute and 12 seconds. They've got to get this done and then be able to reset, heal up, and then move in. There's a lot of things to do. Kurev's not going to be able to do it. It seems like it's going the way of Aurora yet again. Our number one overall in this lobby. And they have only placed first place as they have played in the Pro League. So another day going well, but can they do enough? Our deck, he's going to hit that syringe. Aftermath Saul still alive. And there's still a lot of work to do. 47 seconds for them to get all the way in. And Orgus and Hungry waiting for them on Barometer. That's going to be a tough one. We'll follow that story in just a moment as we pick up with Lasique de France in ninth place, pushing in downhill. May very well go over a team as Jurassic is where we'd find our late rotators into the next ring. There was a little bit of crafting over here earlier. And for that very reason, LCDF would sure like to rotate through without a fight, but they are going to be unable to do it. Is getting shot from afar by Exo Clan makes things a lot more difficult. Aftermath do go down. Stalizi was unable to outheal the ring, and it was only going to get more difficult in the next couple of seconds, as now the circle constricts even further and the damage takes, takes a tick up. Now, the big, big thing to know with Aurora is still out there. You mentioned Aftermath, and, and obviously falling out that the thing is they have the trident yes the zone is going to start pulling but as long as they've been able to heal up they should be able to cover a decent bit of distance so that top squad that a lot of people are looking at still alive and ready orglis and hungry a solo has made their way into the zone as well and as we can see alliance a team falling out of the top 10 yet again in game one can they break that run that they've been having some crafting done by hockeys just trying to get up to that next level and it might be the evo shield that he's working and uh it certainly is yuki just holding vision with the 30 30 repeater seems to be really the weapon of choice i mean it's just so good dia um, we're seeing a lot of scouts forego foregone here in this meta obviously a weapon that has been one of the best uh for a long stint but i think the 30 30 just offering a little more flexibility and versatility which is what this meta calls for really it really is, and you'll notice that on the 3030, because they had access to the crafter, we could have had, say, the Skull Piercer Sniper stock. Mm. What I want to bring attention to here is the fact that because Alliance are contesting for Lightning Rod, they're splitting a POI, they're not getting loot, they instead had to use those crafting mats on getting bats. It's fortunate that they, mm. that they were able to grab them, but I'd be remiss not to acknowledge the loot deficit that they're playing these mm. games with. That is a great point as well. So much of it is a currency game in Apex. You don't see it often. All of those things happening underneath the action. That's what makes this game so varied and tiered in terms of the levels that things are working on. Sometimes it is about straight up hitting your bullets into the other player's hitbox, but sometimes it's so much more than that in terms of what your economy looks like to be able to be put in a situation or, or the things you don't do because you know you won't be able to survive too long. Right now, we've seen a lobby that has consistently stayed pretty dispassionate in terms of fights, except for the early game, go down to 18 squads. Still a majority of our teams alive and well, only six players down total, and we are here midway through ring three. It's about to be a very cramped space, and I'm not sure there's enough room for everybody soon. I'm, I'm pouring one out for Orglis and Hungry right now. From a fight at Echo HQ that lost them a member, to crafting their beacons at Barometer, to rezzing in Jurassic and taking mm. a gravity cannon, and now having to rotate all the way to Echo HQ with three teams on their back? Orglis and Hungry are not having a good game, and many of the teams in Pylon are going to be feeling that way by the end of it. Made in heaven, even trying to fight their way into Echo HQ around this really awkward angle, will be shut down on the forge play gatekeepers for this team as they will for many others that try and pass this gravity cannon and access the next ring forge a lot to prove great players great parts of our community from reply totems to forge as well I'm talking about jay savage and phoenix slayers uh they've these, they've been doing such a great job of staying middle of the pack can they push that envelope here they have to hit a few of these shots to do so sometimes 
just realizing when a fight is lost could be the difference. And so maybe they say, we can't win this one. We've already lost Phoenix. Let's just try to survive and get some more KP. Vex realize they are in the advantage. And so they're going to push that as we transition now over to Alliance, who have found maybe their first bit of contest as they transition from the north down to the south, running into LVH here, Dia. And could have a fight ahead of them, could just have an evac tower and a gravity lift that they want to utilize. No, Yuki's going to go for it here, maybe just to buy <laughs> some time and get out because the zone is pushing in. Alliance, difficult rotate in. Let's hear from Effect because we've got very few seconds. Oh, we've got very few seconds left on his life. In fact, we're going to stay with it as Effect does go down. There was an awkward move from them, and I did respect the gravity lift up into Balloon because there were there was no other way for you to survive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just, you go up because it's the fastest way to get up versus you just going slowly and steadily being an easy target for people to shoot at. But the problem is they're running into these edge fights that don't go their way. And you could argue that the teams that do win those have a great position, but they've run into Vamo Carrere and they've run in now to LVH who have been stalwart in their defenses and Alliance hasn't found a choice. Maybe it's the way these zones are pulling. Maybe it's just the rotation styles. Maybe it's the pace. We don't know what is the problem with the Lions, but yet again, another 14th, 15th place finish. This is not what we expect. We're gonna have to see if they prove us wrong here in their final game. They've got one more in Storm Point before we switch it up. Stay healthy on the low ground here, looking with grenades. Not much to do, Dia, just using the cover of the buildings to stay underneath. And obviously there's a team up above that they don't really want to grab too much attention with. As go next, have stayed alive and pushing the envelope here, trying to kind of act as their own version of a wall for any teams trying to poke their way through. LCDF, as we did discuss, stuck on this side of Pylon with so many others, and Orglis and Hungry again on the wrong side of this fight. LCDF on the verge of taking them down, but with just Psychop and needing to come up to the high ground as well. This could get dicey. Psychop doesn't connect for a whole lot of damage. 202 go down. We're into the top 12, but Psychop again, fighting low ground to high, is likely to die here, and both squads are certain to die on the next zone close. That's the most difficult part of this and this is where you have to say what it, what's worth it i mean do we want to just try to survive are we trying to get placement points we want the full down they're going to get at least one kill there but again you're only getting a couple points placement above 15. Oh. big shots from psychop though he might have just answered that i think there was the attempt to try to go and psychop hitting so many shots i am wow impressed there look at that unlucky we knew he could aim well, but it just may be a day late and a dollar short because now he's got to get through the zone and get through a huge wall of rocks. It just not may not be enough time. LVH also running into pressure, running into the piercing spikes. They'll spend 300 damage worth of bullets on that as Jay Hanzo pops the shield battery and teams falling like flies. I think that will be the end of Orglis and Hungry as well, very soon as well. Exo Clan falls, Orglis and Hungry falls, and now we have moved into our top 10. Go next, get Conduit ulted and shot from multiple angles. What a late rotate and what a way to go down. Just one member left, but go next. Unlikely to survive this as even now the zone forces them into the open, right into the sight lines of teams like you, AIM, and Vamo Carrer. Yeah, Vamo Carrer, really the team we haven't looked at right now because they're not in the action. They have the best spot they are not fighting right now as all of these teams converge. It's six squads left. It was just 12. What are we looking no at? Way. Amia has stayed so patient and it's been like, all right, they hit a button. It's time to go and just go crazy. Aimbot not even able to aim as infinite falls and this could be the end of them. They're gonna have to clutch up here in the smokes. I really appreciate that you aim are going for this, but man, fighting for this spot feels terrible because in the next zone close, rotating from here is a death sentence. Max Drape pops in, finishes off a kill, and now you aim, they're the ones that have to cross this vast distance with so many other teams looking over at them. Infinite, one of those squads that has now at least managed to survive as a duo that can cause problems for you aim as everybody's got to close the gap into Echo HQ proper. 
Phoenix Legacy still alive in that building we had talked about, holding down a spot. Famo Carrer early on in their engagement have rotated with that Skyward Dive and have found themselves in the spot we first saw Orglis and Hungry go back and forth and lose and get on their journey, which ultimately led to below a top 10 finish. Cold there underneath as well. And again, you aim. It's a team that faced off Famo Carrer last game in a 3v3 to win it has a chance to maybe do that again. Max Drafee getting that med kit off, now trying to get the shield battery. Zone starting to pull. These teams on the northwestern side of what you're looking at right now, Phoenix Legacy, maybe Infinite, might have to go to each other and see if they can steal one of each other's territory. Vamo Carrera has sight over all of them, but how patient do they want to play, Dia, knowing they don't have to move yet again? Phoenix Legacy are playing with no territory right now. Inside of this box is a fake place to play, but it's got them <laughs> in the position where they can at least move into zone. They hit a quick catalyst wall as they drop down to the floor. Alpha Draft still up, but barely has to use that 30-30 hit fire that you talked about earlier, and it does not work. Vex, gatekeep them effectively. You aim, start swinging this fight as you aim have done so often this game, coming in for the third party, finishing off the kills and continuing continuing their rampage from game one. Sometimes it's a matter of skill. Sometimes it's a matter of timing. And you can't say that there isn't skill in getting the timing right. They seem to have done it again and again and perfected how to show up in these fights where in this lobby, the most consistent thing has been teams fighting at the wrong time to benefit them, whether the zone or whether the third party ends up finishing them off, something spoils their day. You aim, have got it right. Vex as well, and we're seeing JMW, Graceful, Tyler FPS on cold. They, they've got skills of a former land winner. They've got the skills of an IGL. This could be a game that maybe they sneak in, but it's hard to say that we might not see a Vamo Carrera, you aim back to back in games one and game two, Dia. They are looking like they've got low ground and high ground priority positions. You have to imagine that it's the case, especially with Watson providing a lot of value in this end game territory because their ability to control space when it's not a straight up 3v3 is so much more impactful. Nobody can actually move up and challenge Vamo Carrer. And if we're looking at the map in the upper left, Vamo Carrer have such a fantastic ring pull. They're not forced to leave the center of Echo HQ early. Crazy. They can play with this free cover for so much longer than any other team. It's amazing to see Vamo Career too, picking the Watson and, and being able to do this in a way where they go, we want to play inside. It's it's basically limiting the impact of what this meta has done, which is uh, finding a way to utilize not only their strengths, but take away the strengths of the Bangalore, which so many people are playing. Cole, they've got a chance to maybe do something and spoil the party for you aim and Vamo Career. Let's listen in and see how Graceful leads this team to potentially victory. 70 right on someone. Okay, we're fine, we're fine, we're no, fine. You're fine, you're fine. You still got con. Yeah, I'm still just gonna hit anyway. Picking a prowler. One's on the left corner. I'm going in. Swinging in, swinging in, swinging in. Then on you. Try to rotate the rotate the rotate. Behind you, behind you. Last guy behind me. Last guy right, right, right. on me. In the right corner, right corner, right corner. Yeah. In here. He doesn't have a shield. Running out, running out. Nice oh, shit. Shit, baby. Last guy behind me. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. Pressing. Do you have con here or no? Yes, 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 yes. I have con out too. Him. Go forward, go forward. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. fair life, fair life. Oh, no, no, shield, no, shield. Play right, yeah, play yeah, right, play it. right. Heal, Jake, heal. The zone is about to yeah. pick. I need front. Oh, what a card. Things I never want to see in in-game. Oh my goodness, an energy barricade as I'm crawling forward with no space. Vamo Carrera oh give that all the space all game long, but can they do the damage when the moment counts? It's clutch time, and UAM sinks it from deep. They take the win yet again against Vamo Carrera. Yeah, it is amazing to watch that, and what a listen-in we got to have with Colt, who ended up being in reality, the last team that UAM had to fight. Vamo Carrera sitting on the inside for so long left them with no choice but to tank zone damage whilst fighting. That was a devastating finish, but a very good one from UAM. 
I mean, you aim, they played that outside so well. One of the teams that is pushing in, taking fights at the right time. And we saw it again and again. We saw it from the low ground being able to swing in on that earlier fight where we were seeing Vex and Phoenix Legacy go at it. And it ultimately was just a matter of timing. You aim has gotten it right. Vamo Carrera too. How do they overcome this kind of style? Now, I guess that's the bigger question too, Dia. Do you need to overcome it? You're doing everything that you need. You're getting second place finishes, tons of points. If this keeps up, you'll get a second or first place overall in this split uh, in this split day. So at the end of the day, I think that's all you could be hoping for. I'm pretty sure Kashera is very happy with this team, even though they're not getting the wins. But let's walk through the highlights of that game because, man, it was slow and then chaos. It, this battle that happened really early on for Echo HQ determined so much of the rest of the game that it was the pivotal moment for me. The, what, the way that Orgless and Hungary moved over, and remember that Phoenix Legacy, even though we didn't discuss them a lot in the late game, also changed the course of it for good by coming over and forcing Orgless and Hungary to ultimately lose a member, push 202 at a disadvantage, and then recover through Pylon back into the zone. It claimed so many teams on the way in, and that's to say nothing of teams like Aurora that were constantly fighting on the edge of the ring. Teams like Les Cites de France that were doing exactly the same, and Alliance, who Rain Day, again, did not get their ultimately shot at an endgame. Yeah, I mean, when you look at uh, in-game as well, it's been kind of a similar ending, but it's been so different in terms of how this has transpired. You mentioned being able to rotate and finding those gaps in play to find your moment. Well, you know, LVH is a team that easily could have taken this out, but they show up just a little bit too late, and that's where Infinite is kind of waiting for them. It seems like maybe Amiya is a little slow to start. I don't know if that's going to continue throughout the rest of the day. UAM and Vamo Career clearly playing their style. You aim just feeling like they're ready to win fights and they're winning most of them. Vamo Career saying, we're not going to play this end zone, rotate late game. We're not going to play edge. We're going to go straight to where we want to finish. And we're going to hold it down with our Watson and with our squad. They've done this with Crypto before and it's worked out well for Kashira. It's a tried and true plan, but does it ultimately get them where they want? Second place was notably where Kashira and squad ended against DSM when Hal came up and landed down from the heavens. So second place might just be what this gets. They're happy for it now in split. They may have to adjust and land if they make it there to get the ultimate prize. This was match one. Team comparison between Vamo Carrera and uh, obviously placement points going the way of you aim. Kills going the way of you aim assists. But overall damage, Vamo Carrera edging them out just a little bit. And it's just by a touch, but so much of VQ's damage does come from the mid game where they're navigating squads, even like you aim, that were rotating below them. A lot of their kills coming from this as well. VQ do take fights, but very rarely are they engagements that are straight up 3v3s. They are almost <clears throat> always third parties to god spots, and I can totally attribute that to the IGLing of this team. Their fights are going well because they've got talent, but their fights are winning them games because they're picking the right ones at the right time, and that is all Kashera. That is a very, very good point. You have experience like Kashera, who's been in those moments, been in the literal position to win a LAN, uh, and also been in the position to lead this league, to win uh, a, a split, to, to win a championship, uh, a playoffs championship a few years ago, where people were very, very upset about it. 11 games had gone. They thought other people deserved it, but no, it's who takes the win. I think it's a good sign for Kashira to get back into winning form. Obviously, a new squad. But are we seeing the development of a little rivalry here, at least today? You aim, Vamo Carrere. If game three gives us the exact same thing, I'm going to say this isn't a coincidence. We might be seeing this a lot more in our B versus C matchups in EMEA whenever it happens. But overall, top 10, Dia, what stands out to you? I, of course, we, we talked about our top two. What stands out here is Phoenix Legacy, who have made their way again, at least in terms of placements there, and LVH, who have gotten 12 points with nine Massive. kills during the course of this game. When you see a, a gap in the kills like that among the rest, you have to point it out. LVH clearly had something going this game, albeit it was cut short. You know, Graceful and Cole, JMW, and, and obviously uh, being able to have that type of experience on the squad and joined us last broadcast as well gave us some great thoughts and awarenesses you know this is something that i think is a good sign for cold going into the rest of these games we've got four more for the day orglis and hungry 
you know, four kills, that'll do a lot. Remember, Phoenix Legacy plays six. They only have three points. Orgus and Hungry have five. So it shows you, even though placement doesn't always, uh, placement is important. It doesn't always tell the full story. Let's see the France as well and Aurora a team that I think we have to keep our eyes on. Alliance, though, this is maybe my biggest story. It's not a positive story, but there's always a chance to do it. This is the end of the beginning. We've wanted to see them start off strong the way they ended last year. It was a disappointing day one. It is looking like they have to make a strong and quick shift here in day three to change that narrative, Dia. And it really is. And speaking of shifts, I can't help but look at Aftermath, who in the course of one game have gone from gods of mill to not making it into ring two they do still mm. hold a nice place overall but the disparity between those two positions says a lot about aftermath's game plan when it comes to zones that do not pull directly to them and i'll be keeping my eye on this squad during especially match three I mean, is it the caps or curse here? Alliance, Aurora, and uh, Orglis and Hungry all in the bottom 10. Did we, are we responsible for this? Yeah, is this, is this, should we have switched it up? I mean, you know. My lawyer know. has advised me not to speak on this. Not to comment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. smart. So is mine. So is mine. Um, I, I hope you guys are having fun with us. We are having a great time as well. Randy and Tia, we're going to go to break. We'll be back with some more casting and some more action. Game three, our final game of Stormpoint coming up. Welcome back, everybody, here to the ALGS. We are just finished with game number two with an EMEA for groups B and C. And Dia, that did not disappoint whatsoever. The teams that needed to perform, well, they're here and they're performing. You aim staying on top with two back-to-back -back wins. They have one last game on Storm Point, and with this team looking at their history after the last time that they got to play, they're looking to possibly be a very Storm Point heavy team right now. Yesterday, they finished second, eighth, and seventh on Storm Point, but then on World's Edge, when we made that transition, they finished 19th, 17th, and 19th. Now, hopefully, this is the momentum that they need to continue on this domination while we make that transition. It very well could be, Vicky, and I want to point out, while we're here, while we're looking at this graphic that makes it so obvious, bonus points are actually achievable for UAIM right now. With two wins in a row, a third win oh, yeah. would get them a bonus point in the league on the day and push them further up the overall standings, starting to make them a lot bigger of a contender for LAN. That's really interesting to talk about, actually. That, that's something that you have to factor in, depending on if they get another dub as well. So with the points on top of the fact that they could possibly be looking at a third win, that's uh, all the favor for that squad. So looking at Stormpoint being this last map that we have before we go into World's Edge, they got a lot on their plate. They're feeling pretty confident individually. Max Strafe, I believe, had finished that previous game with 5kp, and the rest of his squad had 4kp. So with their rotations and the timing on that, on top of taking the fights that they have been taking, they look like they're very cohesive today. They really are, and a big part of this has been, shockingly to me, their 
capability to risk their entire game simply to get a few more KP, fully believing that they'll survive it. We saw it over in Echo HQ earlier, and we are likely to see it again as they are willing to go, you know what? We'll use an ult or two. We'll, we'll burn all of our smokes just to make sure we have an unchallenged angle from which to collect a single more point. I was waiting here to see if we were going to get that 50-50, and it looks like I am not disappointed whatsoever over here by Mill. It's Aftermath versus Mate in Heaven once again. Aftermath having a pretty good first game, falling off shortly, though, for game number two. Don't want to repeat this mistake. The moment he turns around, he gets beamed from behind. And Mate in Heaven taking control of the high ground before Synetic drops down first. He's got the R9 and a Rampage for this weapon loadout. Pretty good start right here while taking some warning shots, also noting that they already have a blue evil shield on the other side. Let's not forget the threat of Exo last game. With this fight starting to extend, no knocks on either side, yet Made in Heaven looking better than they have in any game up until now. Both these teams are giving Exo time to make the decision whether they'll third party or not. Oh, you talk about Exo landing over by down beast. I see them in the distance, still making their way as Aftermath want to clean up this fight quickly. The team that's not running the Catalyst, by the way, which is very interesting, actually opting for the Conduit and the Horizon. So try to play passive aggressively when it comes to taking that position, that verticality that is so important in FPSs in general. But looking at Stalls and his loadout, he's got the PK and a G7. They pinpoint where they may be in this next building right next to Mill. And this fight has been lasting for quite some time, so I believe Exocar probably already getting whiff of this fight that's been happening in the last two games, making their way over. They'll hear the shots on their way by, that's for certain, but will they get here before Aftermath go down with Stalizi already fallen? Synetic follows, and an unreloaded Eva, but a seal off of the door is a big move for Tax, giving Mead and Heaven the chance to reset. Trade off right here, too, with the Eva 8. That's all you need to get that down. The one last straggler left on the other side here. No conduit attack to save you now. As Kuriv is running for his life, looking for the rat plays, knowing very well that they have already gone for that reset. So now you just got to make do with what you've got. And you got to go for a quick rotate because you already know that Aurora landing in Cenote Cave will be able to make their rotate very shortly as we take a look at another Southern Circle. Okay, so we have already had so far a circle over by Mill. You saw in game number two, the Echo HQ and Circle, and it's looking very similarly now in this game three. It really is. You can tell, not just because of the rings, but the fact that Phoenix Legacy have again teleported themselves into <laughs> this ring. Oh my lord, are they moving fast. They're so quick with it. Making their move from Jurassic all the way down there already here. When we take a look at this fight happening between Vex, seeing how they're going to try to navigate around this, considering that it was their conduit that they lost first, so they have to heal up their own shields as ESG taking onto the high ground. It's Luka. This is a team that I was really excited to take a look at individually. So many talented players that make up this team, but have been having a very slow start so far in the Pro League. Nice. Lysel cleans them up and taking Vex out of this lobby as the first team out. Great control of the angles, and ESG have certainly had their share of, especially in the last day, getting some early game fights in with their fight against Full English just yesterday immediately off of drop. They have nobody else in the direct areas, even those squads that land Command Center are instead waiting for somebody to come pay them a visit. Hmm. It's all about the weight game here. Quiet but deadly. Vamos get in landing here and waiting patiently but they will not be moving anytime soon i'm not expecting it but taking a look at kashira's loadout though that's something we can definitely focus on he's got the gold light mag he's got this r9 is a gold r9 and he's got the nemesis as his second weapon because they know after hearing that fight look who's waiting in the distance they get up from crouching but it's esg making their way over dia oh, they can hear the spiders too with, with all this data on ESG, ESG should go down immediately. Will they wait, check their corners? Wait. They're already playing cautiously. <laughs> no, he does he know? No, he doesn't know. <laughs> Finds out right now that Lufka's already down. ESG in big trouble fighting the spiders and Bubble Carrier with Kashera on the run. <gasps> that was Lufka saying there's a disturbance in the forest. I don't feel safe here. Let me just, oh no, I regret everything. Kashera, the plan coming into fruition as they chase down the duo from behind, taking advantage of the sneaky play that they took advantage from Lufka.
Well, single kill is going to be plenty for them, it seems, as the full chase on ESG does not get completed. They'll finish off the spiders and make their way further through command center with an extra point to boot. Echo HQ, however, the place to be, as we've already seen through last game, has LVH starting to populate and make their way up the stairs. It is a battle for every inch of vertical space they're able to take, but they're making it work. So much fighting happening on each side of where that next circle is pulling here as LVH get three tricks knocked, but with the height, putting them in a vulnerable position. See, Wives now having to navigate around, Lifeman taking control of that gravity lift, cleaning up the last straggler from no days off. That's our second team that we're saying goodbye to in this lobby before they wait to go onto World's Edge. But look how many teams have already made their way into Echo. It's quite a bit, and because we had last game to prepare in this way, some teams are choosing not to rotate through pylon this time around. It's a whole lot easier now that it doesn't have crafting. Aurora, however, playing a very similar game to VQ, waiting for the kills to come to them. Stay healthy, you're not going to take the bait at the moment, but... Aurora are playing this time a game that suits them a little bit better. They're not waiting outside of zone. They're instead trying to occupy space. And while this may be low priority space, it's still good for Aurora to be able to sit around the edge of the ring and pick their fights. Waiting here. They now make this rotation. Zoom, zoom away out of Coastal. I believe there's two teams around them here, but while waiting behind the rock, they don't want to leave anyone behind. Nobody gets left behind in the Aurora team here as I manage to actually get away from that situation. I do like the option to take the Trident here because you are very vulnerable if you are on foot getting around that low ground land over by that new high ground that's made close to Coastal Camp. But what they really wanted was probably the ring beacon that was there. Whether they can't even get the scan on the ring beacon. Just gonna have to wait. Maybe a survey instead for O Rain to take advantage of, but that's just gonna go into the hands of Go Next while they make the southern rotation right on top of all the other teams that have already made that rotation into Echo. I believe we have like five squads that have already found themselves in that final circle. Now, because Aurora see as many Tridents as they do, they know that a rotation in front of them is going to be gatekept. In this particular case, Orglis and Hungry stand in their way, who have again made the early move into Echo, but without fighting for it this time, and are honestly having a much better game. Look at Aurora's just waiting in sneak. Look at them looking back here, trying to see... If they could try to circle keep, go next if they opt to go in that rotation, or if they want to stay to their guns and actually go to that congestion that you currently see the Forge sitting in right there. That's going to get congested even quicker with Stay Healthy and Made in Heaven making their rotate. You can see where that next circle is going to be pulling in. So many 30-30 shots ringing out like fireworks in this lobby. I mean, no surprise there, like we mentioned, what's in the Replicator, but Bamo get in in a very difficult situation. Playing off the low ground, that's not going to stop life. And he drops down. Why? He's got that gravity lift. It's all about being aggressive <laughs> when you're running the Bangalore. And Bamo get in. The team that got second for game one and two are now out in 18th. And you, you've got a feel for them after this as well because a Valkyrie ult into a surely safe spot, at least in their comms, did not work out. LVH offer no mercy to the squads that move in behind them, clearing their backs immediately as soon as they saw flesh. That was a very nice play from LVH to make the move down, take the fight as efficiently as they did, and it means that they shouldn't have lost out on a lot of territory, still being able to control the high ground of Echo HQ. Now, three points the richer. Crazy seeing the way that they've been playing this here too. With Lifen taking control as the entry fragger for a lot of those fights that we just saw. I believe that actually allows them to hit six KP already with 17 squads left and them holding an amazing position for that next circle and where it's gonna be pulling. Aurora. Okay. I mean, I don't think they have enough uh tridents here, honestly. I feel like they may need a fourth one if they really want to create that barrier with the rest of the lobby. But they got a plan waiting, riding out with their own tridents each. And hanging out by that choke while we take a look at Aftermath. Also fighting for their lives, trying to get that res into Flash. Getting him right back into this fight. Taking this fight, though, is incredibly risky. They don't have information, it looks like, for where that next circle may be pulling. But this is where a lot of the fighting from the northern teams are going to be finding themselves over by Pylon. 
And of course, it's LCDF that are coming up behind them. Aftermath find themselves in another complex rotation that they had not prepared for. Is it in? does take a bit of damage, but with Stalizi going down, it looks like still Aftermath that are on the worst end of this. Okay. All right. <laughs> when oh. you see the 112 pop up, it, it doesn't feel good. The boat check makes your eyes water as it brisks through you, especially when you have a blue evil shield like that. Oh, Flash, unfortunately going down right there with a nice little heady from Psycop. Now looking behind, there's so many teams going on to pylon too by the way looking ahead is cold by the northern choke point we saw already lasita fonts hanging out by the northwest side stay healthy still in the middle and it's understandable what they're fighting for is not only the high ground to get some kp but there's not only a ring console there but a survey beacon too but that ring console is what all these teams want to look for I sure like the extra information. Stay healthy. The real beneficiaries in theory, but it may be that once you hit the ring console, you realize just how far out of the game you are. This is the a basically exact mirror of what we saw last game with all the teams in Pylon having to fight their way out up the ridge line or die inside of Pylon. Stay healthy with Urban, and so much energy out here with the Volt. It does eat up a good amount of ammo. I know it does. It does eat it up though. He's got that purple mag attached to that Volt, but looking to see where they could rotate next. They hear the team right above them. They see where that next circle is gonna be moving and they have to move in the next 20 seconds right now. So looking to see where they could go in the least populated rotation, especially looking at the fact that they have the cat wall, they could take advantage of that cat wall, but where do they put it with the team behind them having height and then the team to their right that is looking for the same rotation? It's really difficult to make that choice between walling off one side of you or saving it for the team above. Aftermath are choosing not to deal with any of that. This is, remember, the last member of Aftermath that'll try and make their way in as a rat towards the next zone, fighting over by the gravity cannon near Echo HQ. Cold taking the opposite approach, exiting Pylon through the eastern side, and time is of the essence here, time that they simply do not have. With another catalyst wall going up in front of them, you have to move huh. forward. It's move forward or die and at this point it might be move forward and die that was with an evac just called in before their eyes too graceful is feasting as he takes control and takes care of light they take the evac tower thank you very much and they're already going in for that rotation around that northern choke as a full squad alliance as they get to fly over them get to look above and stay healthy aren't as healthy as you would expect here losing out on two it's only up to urban who has a blue evil shield to stop the straggler from behind the circle damage is going to be done as he forces his way into where that next circle is he gets stopped and stay healthy is out in 17th it's aftermath though still trying to fight for their life as a duo now here too or actually as a full three man as they also make their rotation into that fight that we just saw versus let's take their fonts in that corner go next now find arctic attacks that's two down leaving only one to go aftermath finally get eliminated here off of the rip can one coming up but this at least gives let's see some time to reset before taking that fight versus ecg in front of them with LCDF being one of the last two squads remaining, it looks like we're running this back. Last time, it came down to a 1v1 between Psycop and Org Listen Hungry. This time, a 3v1 makes the odds a lot better. ESG go down. LCDF move up a single placement. But now, do they have the evacs to get out of here, or do we just wait for LCDF to die alone? Well, at least from Kiner's case, he doesn't want any of that. So they got that evac tower ready if they could go right through this other side. And he got some extra loot before they make that rotate in less than 35 seconds because this circle will absolutely hurt too. Depends on where they want to go though. We know that the chokes over to the west side will definitely be congested by the teams that may be holding on to that slight lip by the gravity cannon. But most of these squads have already found some safety inside of Echo. Alliance making a very similar play that they did last game, using an evac tower to try and make their way into the zone, but they take a bit of a different approach, ultimately using a trident to make their way into Echo HQ, a beautifully placed evac tower, could not have been two inches lower 
lets LCDF make their way into zone. This is a game, perhaps a tournament changing move for LCDF, especially as they take down Kizaruna immediately. Infinite down a member and LCDF going strong at Echo. You're blinking, you may miss it with the quickness. They followed up beautifully as Psych Up, having to restabilize though across from them. You know, Aimbot is looking down, Graceful literally won as he's healing up probably with the Phoenix there too. Alliance coming in shortly though, right over to the other side with so many other teams of follow up having to be careful. Go next, take this next fight with Bambino being on that conduit. We're able to see a little bit of action from Go Next yesterday too, where every time I think about Bambino, I always think about the Fusey, but now we're seeing them transition over to that conduit, seeing what this could provide for the fight that they want to take. Infinite do get eliminated here, and they see their font still alive, actually we're able Able to get inside this building, DR. Every time they, they reminded me of a hero that I read about named I, I believe it was Knight. Knight and Fog that worked together. Where every time you looked away from Knight, she transformed into this unstoppable beast. And that is exactly what Lesitas de France are doing. As soon as we look away, they're taking out squads, they're dominating POIs, and while we're up here with Go Next, who knows what they're doing? And what they're doing right now is taking care of Phoenix Legacy. Kyrie being the one to get knock as go next or stopping them from not only trying to take the zip and the team coming in right there, right behind them. So you see Bambino incredibly low. The tech isn't going to be enough to save the rest of this team. Go next, get the yep. lead. And you talk about being a beast. It was Lucita Fonta had taken them out. Phoenix Legacy still in this with Sabs and Alpha Draft trying to find Psych up on the other side. Psychop, just one member left, but they have claimed another squad. This is seven kills, ten for the team, already picked up by LCDF. And Psychop, if they can get just one more placement, will make it that much better. Oh. Huge beam off of the R99, but it isn't enough to finish a kill. Psychop instead dipping back. Five seconds left on the smoke for coverage from the outside. It's going to expire. LCDF will go down. Phoenix Legacy, as a two-person team, have to move their way into further Echo HQ. That's the wingman taking a headshot onto what we saw from Psychop too. We also saw Ewing get deleted in the feed. They won't be able to get that extra placement point if they won this third game, but still, they have so many points regardless. We have to see how they do on World's Edge. That's Phoenix Legacy with only Alpha Draft alive. He's got the wingman in hand, looking to try to see if he could try to approach from this low ground. That was a pretty nasty grenade, and looks like it was enough to at least let Alpha Draft move in unconned. Does have a smoke available now for a little more survivability on the Bangalore, but gets shot in the side, and it should be the end of Phoenix Legacy, this time at the hands of Exo. Aurora still control the outside of Echo HQ, while Exo Clan do use a catalyst wall to cut off some sight lines, but ultimately it's this corner that's really providing for them. It's just the chrome that they need right now to stay alive and healthy away from the circle. With eight squads left, you see Orglis and Hungry, Alliance, Cold. LVH202, Exo like we saw before, Aurora and the Forge in this final circle. And look at this madness with OAH on the very top. Aurora taking some shots of the 30-30 onto the team that is going to be forced to exit out of that Echo HQ building. Orgos and Hungry, see if they can start a fight. Using a Horizon Ultimate like this is about clearing kills. The ring oh takes God. one. This should be a this should be a squad finish. <laughs> one gravity lift from Unlucky could very well mean the end of this, but only one frag left means that Unlucky doesn't want to commit it just yet. Instead, staying on height with the rest of the team. We're not going to eliminate Exo just yet, but the ring is sure to do the job for us. Man, look at Unlucky's weapon loadout. He is lacking and is on the sticks when it comes to some of this ammo. We lacking on energy and on heavy for what I saw on the other side there. Exo by a grace hong kong has stayed alive so he is able to get away after the action that we saw in that corner let's jump into a quick listen in with lvh who have been here from the very beginning and with life and going crazy on this horizon okay I'm on, 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 I'm on,
We're good, we're good, we're good. I don't have any light, I don't have any light. I dropped 20. 40. Drop it down, drop it down, drop it down. Dead. Seven. Get, 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 get. One here, one here. Shoot this. I'm looking right. I'm looking right. Come back. Let's play slow, play slow, play slow. Everyone dead, everyone dead. I express, I express. Okay, good, good, good. Two teams, two teams. In front of me. I'm on the 50 on one. Oh, don't want to I'm dropping. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, 14, 14 on one. 14 on the left. Cracking. I'm turning left, turning left. I'm swinging left, swinging left. What is happening? Ah, uh, fucked in. Hey, nice no, try. Nice. Good game. Nice Top two, that's not bad. I should have played you Aurora coming in full force, taking the dub over LVH. But let's talk about those comms deal. LVH, super happy with their performance in that last game on Stormpoint. Life in was going crazy, even as a duo at the very end. That was incredibly close. And ultimately, Aurora being able to recover is what cuts LVH's legs out from under them. But I cannot look at that game and fault LVH for a single decision that they made in the end game. As you said, especially life and taking autonomy. You didn't hear, oh, I should do this or can I do this? You heard, this is what's happening right now because I know that there is a kill and it ended up netting them in terms of kills, maybe three, four additional points. But in terms of placement, the difference is massive. And that was all what life and was able to do. And that's what the confidence that he felt too. You saw it. The moment he went for that shield swap after taking control over that rat over to the side, leaving his back exposed to the team above him, was able to go for the shield swap, clean up a conduit right in front of him after he heard the comps. Let's slow it down a little bit, but he was pedal to the metal there in that moment. He was in it. The momentum was in their favor. And they had a pretty good last game on Stormpoint. Aurora, though, coming in after we saw them with uh, three tridents, I believe, by the choke to the south side, making their way into that next circle, pre-planning ahead of time. And I was very happy to see Aurora succeeding. In fact, let's take a look back at how it happened, because this was a game that we actually got a decent chance at looking looking at these teams seeing them succeed and set up their play styles way way ahead of time if we think about it having teams like lvh that took early fights in echo hq that we were there for and then jumping on over to teams like aurora that were playing out the south side of the ring and ultimately looking to control space as we had called for them to do at the start of the day both these teams did so well VQ did start pretty decently, but were ultimately unable to make it in in the same unpunished way that they had in previous zones because LVH let nothing go. They were pouncing on every single team, and this was it. This was them pouncing on VQ just to make sure that this did not happen again, that VQ did not grab yet another second place finish. It really does highlight how the importance of the Horizon and the way that it could affect your playstyle and trying to secure that KP. Yes, they're also running the Conduit, but that's just basically the double whammy for them and the trade-off if they don't want to have any sort of vision control in general. But this is also a game that Aurora desperately needed. I think before that game, they were in 16th in the overall standings for this lobby. So taking that dub was absolutely huge. And we were talking about the Titans here. The Cetar Fonts, after that rotation, was also able to be a gauntlet for the teams that have been waiting in Echo. They are, again, like night and fog. And ultimately, while they do go down, LCDF changed this game, not just for themselves in the tournament, but for so many other teams like Phoenix Legacy, who ultimately, the damage that they did was able to basically eliminate. EXO did the remainder of that, while we saw them suffering in a corner for a little bit too long. <laughs> They were taken out eventually there too as cold now. You could see JMW playing off that low ground, but it was so chaotic for a lot of the teams that were forced to rotate in. And then in this final circle, I love that we were able to listen to the comms from LVH as soon as possible. Talking about the plan and what they wanted to do, life and moving in, but it was Aurora who were up and healthy, were able to restabilize after that previous fight, able to take out a member from LVH and force a 3v2. Lippin with some 
god tier bamboozles even without mirage just using the gravity lift almost as a <laughs> distraction and aurora taking the win is very well deserved we talked about their control of space they never even touched echo hq simply moving in from the south side six kills for them does put them in first but not in terms of points that is all lvh today yeah, you can see here, LVH, 10 KP is huge winner. I believe they were, what, like third in the overall standings before that game? So they are keeping themselves hefty in the overall standings as Aurora, again, like I mentioned, desperately needed that. Looking all the way down, though, we saw what's going on with the Lions. They still were able to get 7 KP to their name. Maybe not the placement points that they wanted, but the same could be said about Lucique Derfonts with the 10 KP that they're able to get on their rotate. And I love that we actually get to see LCDF run back almost zone for zone the exact same rotation and this time come out on top of that last 3v in this case one then make the rotation out of pylon it is so clear that they have a plan for these things and are ultimately trying to capitalize on the chaos that's created inside of pylon inside of suboptimal rotations by teams that perhaps don't have the escape plan that lcdf had it was really impressive i do want to take a look at our 11th through 20th places unfortunately uam do find themselves here but i'm only giving them so much pity since they did win two games in a <laughs> row Exactly, yeah. All eyes were on them to see if they were going to be able to get the 3 P. Nope, that's going to be shut down. They were trying to play a little too safe. That's why you see no KP. I did see that they were waiting by the next edge of the, where the circle was going to be pulling for a bit too long. But then following up, go next. That was a team that wasn't playing patiently. We saw at the very end that they were trying to take those fights, trying to get into a better position within Echo HQ, which once again, is so crazy. We saw that circle pull down there twice, but a team that didn't do as well as they did in the first two games, all the way in the bottom, is going to be Vamos Querer. Unfortunately, falling down on that last map of Storm Point. We have to see if they can carry some of that success in the first two games into World's Edge. It's, it's funny because since they're running the Valkyrie, they do have the advantage of always having a, an evac tower. But simultaneously, I think a lot of teams have caught up to that and gone, well, I mean, that's a Valkyrie. We've all played against this. We've played against it for almost a year. We <laughs> shoot at Valkyrie and she dies in the sky. <laughs> What year is it right now? Yeah, the Valkyrie coming in. It's going to be interesting if they change things up into World's Edge. But before we dive into that, Dia, I want to bring in my friend Rain Day once again. I want to hear his thoughts hey. after the end of game number three. I'm back. You know, I've been waiting. I've been listening. I've been, I could have done that the entire time. I see why the viewers like tuning in. But I, I wanted to actually add about you aim i mean what an interesting kind of duo that's split and been successful in their own way sonya staying and showing the grace and the confidence to be able to navigate these final circles so well putting you aim in a great spot rugby who was kind of the former duo now coaching aurora and so i think what ends up happening is you see clearly two great players in their own right having an impact for two teams that are now currently performing but in terms of giving you the landscape of the EMEA roster swaps the state of affairs I think we should bring somebody who's an expert in that region maybe he's even played and is playing in that region for a halftime breakdown let's go ahead and send it over and get Mandy in the house we got Mandy from 40 percent worse and just from you know EMEA legacy Mandy what's up man how you doing I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Just chilling, watching the games, you know? Yeah. Hey, man, we just like us. So we're, we're doing the same thing. Listen, I want to I want to first off, thank you for being here and taking the time with us for the halftime. I know all the fans watching, they're pretty excited to hear from you and get your thoughts. I wanted to just first kind of soften it up and kind of let people know how has it been with 40 percent worse? What has your process been like so far with the beginning of the split starting? <laughs> Uh, it's been it's been fine. It's been good. Um, everybody knows that the Shiv uh, unfortunately has tendonitis in both the thumbs, so we haven't been able to play that much together, and therefore it's been hard to practice. But um, we got tenth uh, first week, and yesterday we unfortunately got twentieth. Just like overall bad day. I think we weren't really on the same page, and uh, you know it's just kind of hard. Um, but we're we're playing around all the struggles we have, and of course we're like the underdogs. Um, I'm new to IGLing, um, so yeah, I gotta learn that too, and we're just a brand new team playing against people that played, f like, with each other for months or even years, you know? So, we got a lot to catch up to, and, um, hopefully we can show off, uh, next week, uh, what we've been working on. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for that. I'm, I'm really happy to hear how positive your interaction has been, even after the performance of the last time you guys had played together. I mean, when you guys sat down together and you saw that it was just unorganized, have you guys been able to at least iron out the stuff that you need to going into the next day that you guys play? 
Um, we've talked, uh, we talked about it before we played. We haven't talked, uh, since yesterday, but we're gonna sit down and, uh, have a conversation together and, uh, trying to iron out what we need to work on. And, um, but overall, it's just, it comes down to, uh, playing together, um, and just maybe spending more time together. So, uh, yeah, we, we might have to do that a little bit more, uh, going into the next few days. Now, some fans may know you not from your ALGS work, from your, in, again, incredible play over the past couple of days, but also from your content creation. And I want to know, getting back into competitive play, especially this year, as you were inspired towards the end of last, how has that been for your schedule, for your workflow, when balancing both improving in the ALGS and also still navigating a career as a content creator? It's been fine. I don't really see like a difference because I still play the game um, a lot. Um, so that's just the way I'm trying to keep it everything afloat and stay at uh, and try and stay at the top level. Um, but I've been working a little bit off stream, working on some zones and uh, watching other people play, try to learn some different things from them. So uh, yeah, that's like that's kind of what I'm f been focusing on, and then also play other games and stuff. So yeah kind of what it takes in the gaming world, right? Doing multiple things, wearing different hats, competing, you know, working on some content, uploading some scrims or some videos. There is a grind to it, but it's also a very worthwhile grind when you get to be in positions like this at the top of the world and have a chance to play in the biggest arenas around it. Let's talk though about how this game one, two, and three transpired. And I want to start with you walking us through some of the highlights of the final zones of each of these games, Mandy, starting with game one. We've seen this in game two as well, but walk me through kind of this idea of Vamo Carrere, you aim and these fights. What did you see happening here? Uh, it, was, it was a kind of weird situation because um, I think Kashir's team uh, normally playing against people like with, with, with like more people in in uh, in the zone. We only see two people in the last zone, and it's kind of uh, unorthodox to see that. Um, it's kind of like it's out of the norm, so you have to play it differently. Maybe like a scrim game. And um, but yeah, I just see I, I just see Kashira and the guys just not being aggressive enough, and Max Drift and Sanya taking um, uh, taking advantage of that and taking a bunch of angles on them, and therefore just winning the fight in the end. You know. Because they can't do anything, they're put into a small hole and they're just playing their angles super, super good. Part of the angles too is, you can and, and this kind of conversation, Manny, is just, is there anything in terms of a lineup that stood out to you? The fact that, you know, uh, there was just more of a defensive Watson play, did that kind of hurt Vamo Carrera in this position? And in game two, we kind of saw a similar thing where second place, but because they had to hold the zone with the Watson, they didn't push out, they weren't the aggressors? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, what some teams need to maybe be a little bit more aggressive sometimes. Um, I feel like that could really, really like benefit a lot of uh, Watson players. Um, like right here, we see GMW just popping off and just rolling them, and they played that super, mm. super well. Even though they had uh, what what is that? A, a, a blue, white, and a purple armor, and that's not super good late game, but they still won the fight. Um, so they played that super well, and there's not that much else you can do. But the first team. Uh, I, I would have liked to see them be a little bit more aggressive and play around that um, that Watson ult and uh, like heal off that while they take fights, you know? And this is a great point. I mean, is there something as an IGL, we just talked about this, Vamo Carrera been sitting there the entire time. You aim ends up taking this fight, but is there something, when you look at this from your perspective, something you would have done differently if you were Vamo Carrera to take this win? Is it just aggressiveness or is there is there something else? I yeah, late game I would 100% push out and take the fight because there you just basically just playing for second place, and as soon as you're you hear the other team is fighting, there's no point in not pushing out, um, mm -hmm. because the other team is probably gonna finish up fast, and then you have a chance to actually win the game. There they basically just played for second place and didn't want to do anything else. It's good because then you secure points 100%, but you also like gotta get those extra maybe three points, if not even six points, if you get all the six kills, you know. Yeah, it's a great perspective so, uh, from obviously an yeah. IGL. You know, L LVH too, your quick thoughts on them. They took second place here. They had a heck of a game. Vifes, you both have had stints with Alliance Vifes before you were subbing with them at LAN and stood up on that table, which everyone remembers that moment. How are you feeling about LVH so far? Because they had a lot to prove this season. Yeah, LVH is looking really good and I'm really happy for the boys. Vifes used to be, uh, you know, top competitor in EU. We used to play against him a lot. And I always like um, been really happy about uh, like how good he was in Alliance. And when he stepped down, 
it was it was sad but it's good to see him back again and i uh, i can feel that he's uh, got a lot of you know um what's called like a lot of uh energy and uh mm. passion again yeah mm. So, you know, you're a viewer today, which is awesome. So most of the time you're playing, but I know as as a player, your eyes go maybe different ways than than just people who only watch go. As a player, who are you looking at that's kind of catching your attention? What team in this in this 20 is either maybe not performing or performing really well? You know, what story has caught your eye, Mandy? Uh, you aim uh, really uh, just playing out of their mind right now. Two, two back-to-back wins, that's uh, amazing to see. Uh, it's really hard to pull off just a normal win and then getting two back to back is really really uh really cool to see and uh they're playing it really really well also with a bunch of kills and stuff so yeah one of the one of the interesting things that i was noticing about our top squads and discussion especially in uh, some of the competitive apex circles recently is horizon uh, lvh isn't running it uam isn't running it vq isn't running it and horizon's been such a staple for so long what do you make of horizon's place in the meta right now Wh where does she fit because she's clearly strong how can you run without her uh we're actually gonna sw swap horizon out too we're gonna play gibby instead of horizon now for next week um a little leak there um so uh yeah i'm just not really a horizon player just because the character is more made for people that are very aggressive and uh for the most part controller players and i don't really play like that and that's not really my play style and i feel like i fit more into uh different kind of characters and uh ultimately i feel like it's it's uh worth to play a character that you feel confident uh, confident on because you will play way better on a character you feel confident on than a character that you don't feel confident on and uh so that's why i do the switch and maybe the other people do the switch because of that too you know i would uh love to say that i called this but the uh tier list that i recorded that mentioned this uh had no audio on it so no one will ever know but i do think that gibby is prime to retake <laughs> some real estate here because there is there's no shielding and there's no defense and if and that defensive bombardment with a bunch of other gibbies as well dangerous but with no gibbies um you know uh it's deadly it's truly something that they there's no room to defend against you have especially the way people are playing bangalore smokes outside really cool to hear your thoughts on that we'll see if that comes to play thank you for giving an insight into the pros mind and obviously what's been going on today mandy and uh, good luck with the rest of the split of yeah i hope you guys have an All amazing right. day yeah thank you so much thanks mandy, buddy too and, uh, you know, always fun to talk with them. Dia, I, I love the question you were bringing up as well, kind of getting them into the meta chat. That's going to give us good fodder as we head into these next games. But take a break, my friend. You've been doing some great casting. Me and Vicky are going to hold on to the fort here and get into game four as we transition over to the new set of maps to kick us off for the back half of the day. And Vicky, I guess since we didn't have too many of those later questions for you, let's, let's talk about it. What did you pick up off of what Mandy just spoke to us about? I blinked twice and I heard Gibby and I had to just reassure. I, okay, he said Gibby, but <laughs> you talk about shields and I like how you brought that up at the end. If I could talk to Mandy longer, you know, we would absolutely, but the show mm. must go on. And, uh, you know, the Gibby choice is interesting. If you take a look at APAC, there was some... um interesting is definitely bold i i saw revenant uh wow. at the end of our na show yesterday um, okay it was very interesting we saw revenant we saw newcastle playing aggressively so i think with these different compositions presenting themselves to us that aren't the typical uh conduit uh catalyst and then yeah. bangalore or then you sub the the conduit for horizon vice versa or even the bloodhound now being a staple against the bangalores it's gonna make uh the rest of pro league very interesting because we're seeing more diversity at least for teams playing into their strengths which is something that teams sometimes wait way too long for when you're already at the tail end of pro league when you should have been playing what you were comfortable with for rather than just whatever the bet is presented to you especially if you are someone who believes in it through why you're trying to play and and also when things aren't working the way the rest of the lobby is playing 40 percent worse can only get 100 percent better when they're looking at a 20th position right in terms of their last performance so i think mandy's like hey this is it we let's make some changes and let's utilize our time to get experience because we may not have as much of it as some of the other teams who are spinning 8, 12, 16 hours playing, VOD reviewing, things like that. So I love hearing that information on World's Edge where we see some changes. We've seen a lot of teams shift up compositions throughout the day, Vicky. Could just be 
uh, talk in theory, but we may see it come to fruition here as we head over to our most famous and staple maps of Apex Legends Esports to end our day, World's Edge. Ah, back at home, back to the comfort zone where some of these teams perform better versus Stormpoint. We highlighted that actually with the likes of UAIM and Vamos Get It, but we're gonna have to see how this fares up against the squads that were able to perform on those few games on Stormpoint, now onto World's Edge. I'm also excited, Rain Day, for the potential 50-50s that we may see going into our first game on World's Edge. Let's get started. Let's not waste any more time. We are coming off the dropship. Always exciting when the potential is limitless. And we are seeing it right here. Anything can happen. And if you go based off of our first three games, it's been a solid performance. Playing out of their mind is what Mandy said to quote him, is you aim a team that is certainly not struggling with that. But can they keep it up? That's the question. Or will teams like Alliance, who seem to be landing in a pretty similar spot with them off the southwestern side, you aim leaning towards staging Alliance and Thermal Station, their traditional landing zone that they have held for at least over a year now and uh, made in heaven here in Fragment East near Monument. Uh, going to grab some loot and split this one, a very difficult spot to fight through if you're used to your casual matches. Not a place many people land and live to tell about it, but Aftermath, they're not worried. They've had a 50-50 every single time that they've landed, and this time the contest seems to be a little bit more cordial. They gotta, they, they're always finding themselves duking it out with Made in Heaven off the rip. This is like the fourth time now we see this 50-50 even happening on World's Edge after we made that change, but I don't blame them. I mean, look at what's happening here. We have Monument with a ring console right there, so you know other teams may go for the quick rotate if they hear this fight. Usually, I believe Aftermath was landing in Overlook, which also provides a ring console, but we already see LVH there, yeah. so they made some swaps, and I do believe after what we've seen with those early 50 50s that this is a good fight to take for aftermath if you look at this map too it's interesting lvh is split and phoenix legacy is rotating from geyser very quickly over near that grandma's house area where lvh also has uh, a ring console to be able to get that information potentially or just scout out who might be approaching what they can see if there's anything to poach off of fragment and potentially where the zone will be because this seems to be now where rotations are happening from 202 you can hear either evax going down early and look at this yes phoenix legacy have already set up their home base as well it's uh not one that you want to go into as an intruder but sabs loaded up with the 30 30 in the car going to be able to get some damage level those evo shields and definitely hold off what will be 202 and squad looking maybe to fight here on the other side of the map to get through. We are just non-stop, I guess, here. 202 yeah. playing from inside this building here while Orgless and Hungry fighting for their lives, sending out these arc stars, blowing open doors. 202 lose out on a member while Orgless and Hungry, they had the advantage cleaning up that fight just as quick as it started. And they needed this here too. Orgless, I believe, running into some trouble themselves with some tech. So now being able to clean up that fight can start off some momentum for them massive for them they just need it this is a team that's dealt with a lot of blows losing their org the first two days right before this split kicked off now fighting not just for representation yet again but a place especially at land you can assume that if they do that they will find some representation and that is obviously going to be a ton of motivation but trying to figure it out and have solutions for the problems that have plagued them which is performing in those moments and also trying to play zone and also be a good team fighting team they've been so good at team fighting zone is where they have struggled at times and i think world's edge is a great time for them to show that example of playing it still thriving in those 3v3s but also getting to top tens top fives i think they've done a pretty good job of that today placing second place um third place i believe in our last game as well on storm point huge to see you. What they could do here for game number four is XO have already been inside this building. I know Phoenix Legacy is looking at them from the other side by the choke closer to Geyser. I'll stay healthy, sent out the smoke to then reposition themselves underneath this building. If that building right next to them is unoccupied, which it looks like at the moment it is, they could definitely take advantage of that positioning with the catwalk coming up. They are dancing the Chata slot to get right back in to reset. But they do manage to get away from trouble. But it did cost the catwalk, but it was well worth for them to claim this building. 
and honestly just radiant transfer masuka would have gotten down there i yeah. feel like that's just losing masuko and and maybe they have a mobile respawn but it just complicates things the benefits of catalyst excuse me conduit and a radiant transfer means she gives the shield 60 seven and a half shield per second over the course of a few seconds over time but it also applies to her not just her teammates so another showcase of why this legend has taken the meta by storm and been a huge impact of determining play i almost just you know as we see these teams sit down vicky and kind of set up for future zones my eyes you know my mind goes back to that gibby conversation whereas kind of expanding on that thought process because we see horizon bangalore and catalyst you see a ton of space control right from heights mm -hmm. from smokes from walls but there's no shielding at all i mean grenades they're gonna do really well if you've got them and when you look at a character like gibby that not only brings an ultimate that will destroy your game plan if you allow it to hit. And there's no way for these legends to avoid being hit by it, except maybe going up some mobility. Um, you look at an end game that provides a ton of defense, makes players play into your strengths with that shield again. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of with Mandy where I think if there is a legend and it's not that, I could see Gibby coming in and filling a nice role for a few teams. The way we often see Watsons and Cryptos do it for a few teams to kind of still be effective and really have a dangerous game plan if they get to that top five. Yeah, it's the strengths that we were talking about that I believe make the most sense. You also have to consider the weapon meta and where it's at. And Gibby having that arm shield, you know you always want to put a sniper in your Gibby's hand right there. And putting a 30-30 in Gibby's hand will also allow you to get at least the upper hand advantage on certain trades, especially looking at what evil shields that you're rocking. So even theory crafting beyond end circle there, you have to think about those individual pieces that could definitely benefit them depending on what is their comfort zone and how the other teams react to it. Because teams like Phoenix Legacy Legacy running that crypto, that EMP gonna tear down that dome real quick. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a lot of pocket picks that can come in. We're in a nice position. You know, recently, even going back into it, we saw so much of this being dominated by Valkyries beforehand. And then, of course, Skyward Dive changes and nerfs, evac towers introduced. That's given players different rotation options and it's opened up the meta we saw seer be really like a dominant force i mean if there was a gibby seer being able to cancel reses cancel heals really make that bubble useless and be able to push through it that sent him away but now that seer has kind of gone into obscurity still you know decent in your in your casual games you can still certainly play and ranked up to a certain point this is really a, a chance where you see a meta a little bit more wide open for some of these pocket picks that we're gone because they were hard countered now to maybe come back in if a team believes in them vex sticking to a very simple catalyst horizon bangalore and right now all they got need to do is hit their shots goes up into the air black hole thrown down in a thermite to try to pull him back that should get at least something but vex loses clemmy in the meantime, Babylon's going to have to go hard and try to close this one up. But it's you, Aim, the leaders of the lobby who are on the case. Triple oh, take no. shot hits, but it doesn't work. Sonya having to hit a shield battery. And because they had the life lead earlier, it means he can come in and play the hero. But Vicky, it's now totally up to Sonya to do it. And it just may not be enough. It's the third party coming in, lasting a little bit too long there. Waiting took a little bit too long for them too, and has allowed the Cita Fonts to be invited to the party as they back away here to look at the other squad who is matching them on the other side. It was Alliance. What a sandwich to be in. Look at the graveyard before their eyes, and Alliance taking some shots right over to the Cita Fonts allows Alliance to have control over all this loot. Now, Alliance has been doing this the entire time. It's finally worked out in World's Edge. There's no doubt in my mind, Alliance is extremely comfortable on World's Edge. I think this is the map that, for me, was the biggest surprise in last week, where they had two top five finishes, were looking like a team to beat, as we expected. And then their last game in Stormpoint and their final three in World's Edge, they barely cracked the top 15. So this is much more of the Alliance that I feel we should expect to see, which is a good Stormpoint team, or an even better World's Edge team. And so Haki Suki and, of course, Effect off to a pretty good start here as we transition back towards a little bit south of where that was fighting into Vamo Carrera, Aftermath, Made in Heaven, go next in the western side of Fragment. Lions had a pretty good game last game at the very least. I believe they were found themselves in the top five, top six here, so they can ride on that momentum. Oh, Vamo in another one of our squads with Kashera making the swap over to the Crypto for World's Edge this time around. It's getting enough information to see where everybody is right now in Fragment. Taking an overhead look. 
Kings being over to the other side, but they are not moving anywhere from here. This is like the old school send back in the day. They, <laughs> as Kashira likes to lead the squad the same way. <laughs> you can always have fun with those Watson fences there. I love the pro setups. You see the Vs. It's a little bit of like a study in Apex architecture. And Sins <laughs> certainly has passed. Kashira on the crypto. So we talked about crypto coming in as pocket picks. Not just that, with the Watson as well. This is just classic Kashira. And whether it's a Sin, whether it's Vamo Carrere, you could tell just the fingerprint of this leader showing up anyway and with any squad. Lasit the front, Psycop, Zidane. And you can see a little bit of Phoenix Legacy here peering out. Kiner, I believe. Uh, trying to just, you know, this this is an interesting spot. It's a very hard spot to hold. Hmm. Excuse me, Kiner on Lasita France. But they're trying to push in. Grenades are definitely going to open it up and ultimately having that ultimate in just a few seconds, Vicky. So that could help. And knowing that the circle will be closing in a minute and less than 20 seconds, they could try to take this fight quickly while the other squads waiting in Fragment want to prioritize their rotation. So while they do want to try to take this fight, Alliance don't have to worry about any squads trying to counter rotate behind them. Instead, trying to make their next plan, unless Go Next, who was in Fragment, may want to get involved on this with a late rotate, leaving their backs open. So Lasita Fonts do need to hurry up here. Maxed out Volt, except for the extended mag, second level. And a Rampage pushing ahead, a weapon that probably is not going to be used very often, but when it is used and used correctly, it's going to be devastating. Hi, she. Oh, now with those 30-30 shots ringing through the air, Rain Day, they're able to take some of those shots, get some extra loot for a shield swap, but the Catwalk blocks are few while they get third-partied. Almost too much loot, right, to deal with. So many swaps, so many options. Do you shield that? Do you swap as well sometimes, thinking about it? It's just not the right choice. You got to do something and commit to it. Zidane from LCDF being pushed from behind. Go next. Eliminated in that one. They will have swaps now off of it. ESG trying to get involved. The Bloodhound Ultimate is going to give the information. It's Light Blast. And it's not going to be a Light Blast there. It's going to be full wingman shots. 95 oh. to the dome. Lufka going to end it easily. And now Alliance still holding. And they're going to have to evac tower to get over this chaos. They've got to get away. Haki by himself. Effect Beacon picked up. And Yuki. They should be able to make it, but that wingman, it's scary because just a headshot and a body means Alliance Hockey is down and out. We had five parties come to that fight. ESG, go next. The original stragglers, La Cite Fonts Alliance was insane. Now ESG, one of our teams rocking that blood on. We got to see a great performance from them in that last game, especially from Lufka here. Not on the horizon now, instead, being on that Bloodhound, seeing how they try to play around this cat wall, but playing patiently while they are in that next circle. ESG absolutely looking to push the envelope on Alliance and running into Vamo Carrere. It's been a theme. If you look at the way their rotations have kind of pulled Vamo Carrere, because they're always in zone, they're a little bit ahead of Alliance. The first game, it ended up being the team to push right behind them and take that third party. They're in the exact same position. Even if ESG or Alliance win this battle, Vamo Carrere very close to it no, no days off as well still holding on geyser phoenix legacy and cold are there graceful jmw they're holding this opposite side you can see no days off taking a look at it phoenix legacy to the left above them it's going to be very very difficult if they fight each other one minute left though they have enough time to kind of try to see if they can get an opening anything vicky before they make that move because they know it's going to be difficult Especially with Phoenix Legacy that have not moved from up on top of the hilltop here for that next choke. It's going to be so difficult, even if they do come on top of this fight. Bardo being the only one healthy for his own team wow. gets knocked. It's only wow. three tricks. Who is literally one shot? And guess what? It is the green light for Phoenix Legacy Man. to move in and clean up on aisle three. It's everybody that may fall to the hands of Phoenix Legacy who are up and alive, giving away some of that extra space on the high ground. Let's tune into a Phoenix Legacy listening to see their next move. I'm going. They're fighting the choke, I think, Alpha. Yeah, they are. Atom might be sure. gatekeeping us. No, nobody should gate us. I have accelerant. I I'm gonna take a bit because I need a mm -hmm. fucking... We should, be good on, we should be good on some rocks here. I don't need me. We need you, zone guy. Two okay. seconds. This is barely in Alpha, I think. We can fight the left team and play rocks. Well, now. I think we're gonna might need to look for the left. I yeah. have bad summon needs. I, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, uh, that Okita? Uh, yeah. Here. 
Do they might have to just fight the the, the yeah, they're sliding down. down. Yeah. They're not looking at all at us. Uh, 25 to fucking you. We're like in around here. Too. We're in around here as well. We're like chilling. But it's shit though, no? Over here? If we clear left, we're good. From the yeah. right side, we're gonna get shot now. They're, they're, they're the lab, the, they have a gen there. I'm moving here. Are we walking left or what? Yeah, yeah I'm moving left. Crypto and I don't have EMP. I'm moving yeah, to time. We need to try and force this. There's two teams, two teams there. Okay. Oh, they're fighting, they're fighting. We can go we look at that. Go just go late, go late, go late. Go late. Yeah, yeah, okay. Wait, 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 wait. Just walk up. I'm chilling, I'm chilling. Waiting for a bang. We're good here, we're good here. Just wait. Do they have knocks? No clue. They're on the back side. That's another team, might be. We can play this side if anything. Yeah, we still no knocks. Still no knocks. Watch out! There's a guy over here. I'm coming to you now. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. They're fighting coming, coming. There's a guy right here. Um, fighting over here. Um, the guy right. is one. Come to yeah. me. Come to me. Come to me. Subs. I'm popping south. I'm popping south. Nice. I'm gonna EMP for you. I'm gonna EMP for yeah. you. I'm coming to you. It's just one guy on the left side. The guy uh, solo running here. Okay. He's right here. I'm coming at him. He's right here. Okay, I'm going you need to clear that, there's just two here. people over here. There's a solo, yeah, it's a solo. Two solos. He's running, he's running. He's, running. he's, running. he's a solo. Um, look at this yeah, guy, look at this guy, look at this guy. Yeah, yeah. I'm moving out. I cannot see him. Yeah, I see. I fit my kills. He's running, he's, he's cracked, yeah, he's yeah. cracked. Bandits, bandits, bandits. Yeah, I'm coming, come back, come back. They're gonna fight us. I'm batting, 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 batting. Oh, you're okay, you're I you're cannot see here. I'm going back to you, Alpha. Coming now? Stop, you fucking idiot. We're good, we're good. I'm here, I'm here. I'm popping syringe. I don't. Wait, where, where are they? No. no. Uh, here. He was walking up. Is there anything safe? I didn't check. I'm watching the box. I'm watching this. They're trying to look though. What a position to see Phoenix Legacy take over. Like they were playing the the board game Risk and just keep inching forward with territory vicky that is how you do it from high ground to low ground they've cleared out their left they're looking like they're in a pretty decent position to make a move in this game i know we all felt Kyrie there too you get two knocks you want to finish those kills and you are lacking that heavy ammo too so she was able to get some extra at the very end and still managed to rotate love the comms that we were able to hear from phoenix legacy it's about that next plan and how you want to make this rotate with aurora standing right in front of you I love the work with this team as well. Alpha Draft, you can see how impactful just third partying with that crypto EMP. They've got all of the utility to be able to make a difference here to hold from range, even in these awkward positions with the Watson interception pylon, buy them a little bit of time, safety from some of the grenades, and they're pushing through this catalyst wall. I think they realize it's just about timing here. They've been so good at playing the moments, and that's what Phoenix Legacy are doing, rising from the ashes with the 30-30 hip fire as well. Sabs, she's going crazy. Can she clean it up and give herself a clip in the ALGS? Aurora, though, is coming in to play spoiler to the party. If you thought that they were gonna get involved well you just don't know aurora hard decky back at it again the grim reaper says it's time to sleep as they get another win the grim reaper or the grim griefer coming in with a perfect timing rain day taking that dub and what was also interesting is that phoenix legacy's comms they were highlighting their left side they saw a bunch of teams fighting on that left side but they still were talking about how that was an entry point that other squads could take advantage if they wanted to rotate to the right they saw the opportunity though so that way they could get even more kp and it's similar to what mandy said you're trading off either you're fighting for seconds to get that extra kills or you're fighting for the dub for those extra three points for positioning that you could get in terms of placement they wanted to fight for the kills and aurora came in and sw swept in and took them out and took the dub and i think there, there's some strength to that but so much of it when you think about how the math is going in that it's instinct you can't do all that math in the exact time when you see an opening and you just push some teammates already going in you're kind of committed to it and and that's what was so great about it they played that same way. They waited patiently, but when they saw an opportunity, they went for it. Let's take a look at how this game transpired, though. Storm Point was fun. World's Edge, though, that did not disappoint. New map, new game. The pace just kept at a premium. Actually crazy with Vex also. We saw the chaos, the pile up in this choke point. It wasn't a fourth party. It wasn't just a fifth party. It looked like a sixth party with all the teams that brought themselves up to the play over by this choke. You aim, the seat their fonts, Alliance, go next. So many teams moving away from Fragment as well as that south side of World's Edge. Getting involved in this fight to try to take control over that left side of that final circle still wasn't even safe with the teams that were holding the choke by the 
north side of the map. I mean, that was really the transition between the north and the south side of the map. That choke right there, that basically determined whether six or seven teams were going to be involved in this end zone. And this one too, no days off. And you looked at Cold, they were in this kind of 3v3, or at least they thought, but because they were downhill, it was just a matter of a fast EMP from Crypto and Alpha Draft to allow Sabs and Kyrie to move forward and find some kills there. But this was, I think, the biggest moment. Holding this position, waiting until they saw Forge push onto Vamo Carrer, force Vamo Carrer out, Forge die, they take the space that Vamo Carrer had, and they're able to battle from there on to get a really sweet spot. And being able to finish those kills too, getting extra KP while they were at it, Love to see how they were able to play around it. It was just this fight right here took a little too long with Sabs and holding onto the 30 30, trying to get these hip fire shots around two knockdowns at the same time. It just took way too long and had allowed Aurora to come in before any sort of reset was possible, allowing Aurora to take the dub. They had a pretty good game last game, and now they are coming out on top basically back to back. I mean, this is a fantastic showcase of what you look to see from a team that has put together two top performers last season, one all-time top performer, Hardecki. Again, six kills overall. This team's averaging seven and a half kills per game, which is nuts. And they're also doing it by contributing to each other. Nine impulse, giving a lot of damage and also two assists. Hardecki, a kill, but five assists, 1,200 damage there. Let's not forget Phoenix Legacy, Alpha Draft on the Crypto, three assists. Kyrie showing up with the kills. Sabs, kind of an all-around game there with damage, kills, and assists. And Infinite, Aimbot, Thong, Kizaron. Really, really contributing on all different layers and levels as a squad. These three, really, really something to look at. Uh, especially, Vicky, when you take a look at Phoenix Legacy, who have had kind of an okay start to the day, but that's a real great showcase and it's going to put them in a position to not only top 10, but maybe even if they keep this up, top five throughout the day. Yeah, ranking up, basically, because after their performance yesterday, they did get in the top 10. They got second place twice throughout the day and are looking to continue on that legacy going into today's games. With Aurora taking the back-to-back, -back, I believe they also won on Stormpoint for Game 3 with 6 KP. So I'm yeah. interested to see what that's, what that's going to basically do to this overall standings for this lobby, because Aurora definitely needed it before that Game 3, and now they're looking to stay on top. Well, one of the things we'll bring you up to attention for is remember there is a bonus point awarded for having a 15 point margin on the next team while being in first place. That's the key part. They must be in first place at the end of the series. So far with two wins for UAIM, two wins for Aurora, there's definitely going to be one team at the top. Will they separate themselves enough from each other or will it just be a battle of first? We'll find out. UAIM, surprisingly, after such a big start winning the first two games in Stormpoint, not a great start here for World's Edge. Series results overall, it's UAIM, LVH, and Aurora. And so far, EMEA has done what we expected, kept things tight, and uh, given a lot of teams still a chance here with the two games left to go, Vicky. Now with Aurora now sitting in that third place, look how close it is between all these teams. I mean, even UAIM isn't safe with only a nine point difference between themselves and LVH, all the way down to even Alliance, who we were expecting to have a better game, at least on World's Edge, still finding themselves at least in this top 10 with two more games to go, Rain Day. Yeah, what a fantastic showcase of Apex Legends. We talked meta, we talked potential, we saw new teams kind of show up and rise to the occasion. And now we've got two more games left. Game five, pivotal in determining and setting up your success in this third day of Pro League for EMEA. Who's gonna rise to the top? Who's gonna make it happen? We'll find out in game five right after this.
Welcome back, everyone. Four games down. We got two more to go. Two games left on World's Edge. I'm Vicky Kitty. I'm joined with Dia. And Dia, after the action we saw yesterday, it seems like here Aurora and UAM are looking to feast on this lobby, not giving anybody else the opportunity to take a dub. That is very true. And I can't believe that I'm saying this again as I come back to the desk, but we have an opportunity for bonus points now because in four games, we've only had two winners. Both Aurora and UAM are one game away from giving themselves a bonus point. And I, I think more importantly, having won half the games of the day, which is somehow just at its title, even more impressive than any reward you could offer. If you also want to stand alongside all these other legends, there's a chance for you to be on that main stage too. Definitely want to look into that split one challenger circuit where you could register your team to compete in the ALGS. Absolutely. And it, taking a look back at last game, even, we had Phoenix Legacy, we had Aurora, and we also had Infinite. Out of the three players on Infinite, two of them come from the 2022 Challenger Circuit before paying, being picked up by LCDF. Uh, in, uh, it was Kizarun and Vertage that used to play under Oracle and have made their way, much like you can, this next weekend. Challenger Circuit number one is coming up, and you've only got a few days left to register. So go check it out on battlefly.com slash ALGS. As we prepare to get into match number five, we'll get the chance to see a few more of our Challenger Circuit uprisers take on pro league teams that have been the top for longer, been at the top for longer than I can honestly count. It's awesome too. It gives everybody the opportunity to see what their skill are against all these other pros. They can't find them in the firing range in these 1v1s, but you could see them back in the lobby. So we got to see how that goes out for a lot of our other teams that have made their name here in the pro league. Getting ready for game number five, Dia. This is one of my favorite games. I always say this, and it's because this is the point in time where a lot of these teams, what in the, know where they're standing, so they decide to choose violence like AM right now. Up against LVH, you do have the chance to shut down a big competitor, but LVH have not been going quietly today. G7 at close range and a perfectly timed heal from Vapes. Uh, Keeps Hanzo alive for a few more shots before Flash ultimately ends up falling as well. Lithin and Vafes still on the climb up with the close range Eva. One shot left can change everything. Very little ammunition left for Lifen, but we know the difference this player can make. And look at MIH just waiting over on the other side, close to these rocks here. This is their time to finally get the revenge that they've been looking for with Aftermath landing on top of them. And that is to say, if they don't get taken out first here, gets another knock here for Cell. As he's playing off the low ground, you can see the pings of the communication coming in as Aftermath only having Stahl left after losing out on another teammate, drops down, gets the finisher onto one. Every KP is worth it, and it's made and Abby that have shown their face. Third party finally comes in, and it's just one player left. The easiest third party in the world for Made in Heaven, but they haven't finished off the last kill just yet. Conduit can be pretty darn slippery, especially with the ability to pick shields back up after time. So we will get one squad making it out a little while longer. LVH survive, and with a support legend, no less. Vase is going to book it into the tunnel leading into Geyser and hope that they can find access to crack later on to get the rest of LVH back in the game. Yeah, because there's no replicator over there, unfortunately. You got a circle beacon, but that's not going to do any justice for you right now in the state of you just being the solo conduit. But I love this overhead and taking a look at where this next circle is going to be pulling right there, closer to Lava Fisher over by Countdown. But what's even incredible is to see the circle beacon and the survey beacon over by Lava Fisher, especially with that replicator being there. So something that Go Next and UAM could take advantage of on their rotate. Yeah, a lot of teams, even Alliance, starting to move up, can integrate Lava Fisher into their rotation. My question is whether we are going to get something that pulls a little bit more towards actual countdown or landslide, which is still absolutely a possibility at this point. The ring is pretty ambiguous, but a lot of teams are choosing to sit in countdown simply because of how punishing it can be to get into, whereas on the other side, it's pretty easy to get out of if the ring decides that it's not going here. Crazy to see how that is going to be pulling in. Huh. 
I almost get it. Never waste any time here with their spot and predicting where that circle was going to be pulling here. They've already settled themselves inside one of the buildings over in Countdown. Usually with circles like this, you're going to have a lot of teams coexisting in one spot, whether it be on the low ground or high ground. I'm expecting this circle, for this final circle at least, to be pretty hefty on how many squads we'll have left. Especially with, as you say, this being the fifth game, teams do tend to, especially in game five, play a little bit more conservatively. It's game six where we see teams going, well, this is our last chance to get points, so let's run at everything. But game five, I think you realize that one zero point game can very much shift you around in the standings. So nice 30-30 shots do come from Alliance to get a knock, and it may even turn into a kill with how aggressively they're positioning. Effect, of course, taking the lead on this back on Horizon, and it's nice to see, given how well Effect has performed on this legend in the past. Just breaking free from the chains, letting Effect do what Effect does best, being the fragger that we all know and love, especially as Alliance are looking to perform in these next two games, they're in a pretty good spot over by Grandma's house, over to this north side by Harvester before they make the rotation. But they got three purple Evos, and this is that coexisting that I mentioned. Look at where three tricks is. Hanging on to dear life while no days off are in so much trouble. That is Vamos Get It that is on the high ground here, and that is why you saw three tricks just waiting below. Because no matter where he waits on the low ground, they know exactly where he's gonna be. Not even a real safe place to be right now. Few boxes perhaps uh, could give three tricks a chance to live sits behind one at the moment and vq won't be able to finish this kill without giving up their positioning kashara even overextending a bit too much for my liking giving the angle that savage would have on them so tricks will be able to survive given a small lifeline for now but there are still teams coming from the skyhook area and tricks has attracted attention and will attract more as they attempt to find some small safe corner of world's edge Trying to hop around, the hopping horizon trying to get away. He does manage to survive for right now as Infinite is playing off the low ground. They know about the team that's right on top of them, but this is that coexisting that we had mentioned, except with Infinite's case, they're gonna have to sit pretty here for quite some time. It shouldn't be a problem to just sit quiet for a little while. Infinite don't have a whole lot of shield sustain, however, so they are relying on the cells that they've been able to pick up. Importantly, not the bats, as there's a limited amount of those to keep them topped up as other teams try and poke at them, perhaps to level up their own egos, perhaps to try and find a few kills. That's what World's Edge is really going to come down to, however, with the lower loot density that the map has overall, there's less opportunity for you to pick up things like meds or even attachments that can change your late game. So we'll keep our eyes on teams like Cold and LVH, who are still out here, slumming it in stacks. Huh. Cold, of course, feeling a lot better since they're the ones sitting on the crafter and just making sure that they are prepared to enter an end game fully juiced up. I mean, being on Cold, they're looking to ice up LVH here, solo fighting for their life as they try to rotate around stacks just to look at Cold in the face, or they're probably utilizing that replicator. Looking at how these two squads are going to rotate, though, it's going to be a little tricky coming in from that south side. With so many teams in that next circle talking about ESG, stay healthy, who will be playing by the edge as well as 202. It's going to be difficult to get through there unless you have an evac tower or you use one of uh, the towers to just get right through these chokes. Now, also looking at Aurora, who are also taking their time on this rotate, we could expect Skyhook to be pretty stacked for the teams that are going to try to navigate around Countdown, but weren't able to get to that rotate early. You were talking about this as well with teams that would like to prioritize Lava Fisher for a beacon. I'd like mm. to point out that Alliance did rotate up through there, as are Vex. Both those teams having access to more information than anyone else in Countdown. There is a chance that Forge are able to grab the actual ring console that's in Countdown, but with so many teams around there, it's that much more difficult. We do briefly make a footnote of Stay Healthy losing another member. They had already lost one to Alliance early on the rotate through staging. And this is yet another squad, much like LVH, that's been reduced to a solo and now has very limited impact on the game. Taking control over another team out here now as they make their rotate around staging. Talk about the replicator and knowing all the information. They got the blowdown so they could actually get a scan on the survey beacon over to the other side and the ring beacon to know where people are and where that next circle is pulling. So everything on the buffet table for ESG to work with. Well, Stale Healthy is going to be right behind them making that rotate. You mentioned Alliance. 
with them going right up north to Lava Fisher, these type of circles usually end up on the outskirts by the low ground bins for countdown. If that does end up happening, this rotate from Vex and Alliance from Lava Fisher into countdown could actually be better for them with the natural cover that the rocks to their south provide. Very much so. You could see them with the right prediction, ending up in a top two, top three position, especially now that we've got a wingman that naturally drops with so much ammunition that hackies should be good till the end of the game. We saw over in North America, Sweet making waves with the wingman yesterday. We could very much get the same happening today. Balbalon's going to craft up the shield. Meanwhile, as Vex do try and rectify a bit of their economy, knowing that they'll likely have to take the fight up against Alliance, because going south and trying to enter countdown that way is just setting yourself up for failure. I also love how production pulls up that crafting rotation for the day. It's so important. I know Dia and I have been talking about it basically all day, but having that Moby there too with so many conduits, as well as a Skull Piercer, Purple Sniper Stock, with the amount of 3030s that we've had in these lobbies, it's important for the teams that do want to rotate using the Replicator as that point of interest. And it happens sitting right next to Infinite. I think evidence with their spot of how few spaces are left in Countdown. They're even going to try and start a fight onto Infinite. And a crippled Infinite at that. Not a full squad. Aimbot going down and made in heaven. All three very healthy. Just have to navigate their angles from the high ground. And a great smoke cuts them off. Gives them the opportunity to finish off Infinite. And a few more kills go their way. This is going to be in collaboration with X so who are on the other side both teams wanting a bite out of infinite there and both getting exactly what they came they came forth on the last solo left or the most recent one rather created in countdown we'll be ratting this out for now and it's an unlikely spot to push but not a great one we got a lot of uh, rats, surprisingly. A rather unfinished squad. We got, I believe, two teams that are playing as a dual stay healthy in LVH. Exo's healthy, standing on top here. We got no days off playing this as a rat. With Phoenix Legacy also have gotten down early, as we had seen before the feed. That low ground's already available for more of these teams to try to share some of that space with as long as they're out of the line of sight of the squads that are holding onto that high ground. And this circle's pulling away from the west side of Countdown and right on top of Go Next, which, with Orgless and Hungry rotating out of Landslide, where TO2 has been there basically this whole time, can take advantage of that southern rotation playing on the outskirts of Countdown. T take a look at our teams that late rotated as well. Cold have just made their way right next to Countdown, but stay healthy as a full three-person team are starting to move up and challenge 202 in Landslide. This could be the comeback story for Stay Healthy, though they have limited time to do it. With Aurora fighting their way out of Skyhook, all teams that are currently outside of zone have only 30 seconds to change that. And Aurora, for as kitted as they are, still have very little space with which to work. And that Kraber, though, had me sitting on the edge of my seat. If that Horizon was to open those doors, Nine Impulse just waiting with the itch, with the trigger finger, getting ready to get pulled here. 18 squads left still as more of these teams are making their rotate. Go next, Bambino, maybe one of the members added to the list of rats that we have in this lobby. Right through the cat wall, he takes some of those shots with the Volt. Lacking a little bit, although, on attachments on that Volt since they made that early rotate, having only the white mag. And we see ESG taking this fight against 202, the team that was taking their time to rotate out of Landside to gatekeep the Fragment teams now are finding this fight over to the south side of where that next circle was pulling. Still another squad coming up behind them as well. Landslide is a highly trafficked area, especially with the ring closing in. LVH rock up behind 202 just in time to claim another kill. And now we'll be splitting directions. Do they choose to chase this engagement with ESG or go along the eastern side of the ring contesting teams like perhaps made in heaven. Vaves certainly seems to want the fight right now. Weak as they may be, uses the Radiant Transfer to keep themselves topped up and continues pushing forward into ESG. Another knock goes down. ESG are out, but the fight continues as Vex swing back in to clean up LVH. 
Oh, with another crazy nade. Just as quick as it started, LVH get taken out and Vex have the graveyard to themselves. All the loot for them to feast on. 14 squads left and they could take some time to breathe. It is Orgus and Hungry who are waiting inside of the building south of Countdown right now after we had seen the action go down with the two squads that were fighting. Go next, by the way, still alive here. Made in Heaven trying to restabilize. Nice gold knockdown to at least get the res with some extra health for tax. And will mean that tax is essentially full HP. This team, however, being another one not to run the horizon, doesn't have access to high ground. It can only really enter the zone in one way, with so much ground being covered on the other side by cold. There's not going to be an entrance there. Made in Heaven must enter through the low ground, pushing down onto what is likely stay healthy, sitting in the center of the next ring. We're taking to the skies, Alliance trying to find a place to land. They've found at least the safety inside this low ground. Close to the platform that raises here. And with the Havoc and in, that's all effect needs here. With the turbo already attached to the weapon, he's able to navigate around the Bangalore ult. Not going to overextend with Vex being on the high ground crazy that effect lives there and vex who did rotate in from the south after clearing their backs have made it work so much easier with the proper timing now are bullying alliance how the turn tables vicky being <laughs> able to take high ground on them now when alliance should have been the squad that was able to cut off vex at lava fisher I love to see it. And you aim also, by the way, still alive, still waiting on the high ground by countdown. They've been in that spot for quite some time, close to Vamukarid, who are still inside, by the way, that little tiny building with the comp that they've been rocking. It makes sense. You have the crypto and the Watson. You're just going to be sitting pretty in there until that end circle forces you to move. The Seeker Fonts now taking their time to hang out by the graveyard that we saw all the action go down on this low ground. Trying to get out of the sight of some of the squads that are making their rotate, such as the Forge. Overlooking the teams that have the hike here, close to Alliance. Orgless and Hungry trying to stave off any more pressure from stay, stay healthy. And yeah, with that Catalyst wall, they get out of the line of sight from the teams that are going to be making that rotate and playing underneath the team that's right above them. This, this is such a scary spot to play, but somehow LCDF make it work. VQ were not looking over them. They did not get any shots in the back. And with LCDF now sharing space, as you said, with Forge right above, Pull to the next zone will still be a challenging one. VQ will have to consider this as well without nearly as many mobility tools. They've got a Bangalore and that's it. In terms of making their rotation all the safer, perhaps a team wipe with a nicely timed EMP, but VQ will not have the option to circumvent fights, to cut themselves off from other teams. They have to go through other teams or stop their journey here. Yeah, unlike other squads here, they don't have a catalyst wall to block the line of sight for many of these other teams that are going to be looking at them when they make this rotate. It's actually something that I was wondering for Le Cite de France. They had to burn through that wall, but now with this next move, they'll still be out in the open for the teams that are on the southern point of countdown. VQ already making their next move, and UAM is trying to do the same with round five closing in right behind them. A couple seconds left, taking a look at what they've got to use. No nades in the hands of Arty, which makes this all the more difficult. Not able to clear space without having to peek it yourself. But a catalyst wall in their hands could be the determining factor. Down towards the north side, we've got Forge dropping as we knew they would. Oh. Right on top of Le Cite de France. Only one of these teams is coming out of this alive, and that is only going to be temporary. The catalyst wall drops, but fights are kicking off on the other end of the ring. Oh, Blight. You aim, VQ are all converging on one space. And you can see the teams remaining too. All those teams right above you aim's head here too. While they join alongside Vamo Kirin. They're going to be trying to navigate around these boxes. Max Drafing goes down almost immediately after Lasita Fonts come out from their fight. Kashera also knocked, only leaving Kings up as the up and alive healthy one. Lose out now on Senzid right there in the distance. That is Lasita Fonts. Stay healthy, get eliminated. You aim, finally get eliminated. And VQ somehow are still alive while Yuki is literally one. Kings was heralded as one of the best controller players in South America. And now with two solos right in front of him, will Kings take the bait? Will he rock forward through this catalyst wall? But no, he'll get shot down from above. Unlucky takes him out. Orgless and Hungry take the extension. They claim the life of a solo. They push themselves up a place and in the best spot in the game, put themselves in an even better position somehow to win it.
Orgulus is no longer nerfed. With all the tech running in the way that they want here for this game, they're looking to claim this dub. Being inside this building, knowing very well that there's a team right outside those bunker doors, it is Vex. It is M-I-H waiting underneath the high ground here as graceful is the rat waiting off that slight lip that M-I-H has no idea about. And we did mention this earlier, but MIH weren't running, I believe, Horizons, as if I'm recalling it correctly, which would mean that there is a point in this circle where they're no longer effectively able to third party, where they're relegated to the low ground and a potential heal off to try and get themselves a victory. Orglis and Hungary have to manage them, but more importantly, they have to manage Vex, which is why they're looking off to the east. So the play that is taken to the high ground. You talk about the horizon effects. Have wing one in their arsenal now. Dropping down with the R9. Gets the beamage and a knock onto nice. Exo. Exo with the Santi gets that last shot. While two of the members are one now. They have to make the next move. Love the coordination with that wall. Babylons will be able to get the med kit off. Still make use of the catalyst wall, which goes up the side all the way covering every possible sight line. Vex have become an even bigger problem for Orglis and Hungry since they rinsed Exo so quickly. Now they just have to focus on Orglis and Hungry in front of them. We did talk about this earlier, but Made in Heaven not running the horizon. Now that it's confirmed, we'll have an even <laughs> tougher time making it up. And Vex seem to be gatekeeping Orglis and Hungry miraculously. This Sentinel not failing for Babylons. And in this late game, with everyone having red evil, purple evil, having that senti charged up, you are ripping through them off the rip once you get that first shot in, having advantage. Orglis and Hungry see the team right below them, gets blasted in the face with another senti shot. That is insane. Babylon's is going crazy with that weapon. As Kinda now drops down, tries to take this fight. They gave up the high ground. They're playing for second place, while Vex have all the cards in their favor to take this dub. Made in heaven get eliminated. Last two teams left with the last straggler trying to take the gravity lift no more as vex claim game number five really really clean win from vex the way that they played things out dominating exo in no short fashion over towards the silos then focusing on orglis and hungry who were the number one threat in that ring forcing them to take second place vex didn't give anyone else autonomy in this game and it makes me really happy seeing that because that's just what good Apex Legends looks like. That's managing your threats appropriately. Those senti shots, though? That was crazy off. I mean, close quarters like that, you don't need a sight. He was rocking that iron sight perfectly fine. Had that Sentinel charge up for that final fight. And the moment that they saw that they were the only ones that had claimed that high ground, they knew that they were the winners for that game. And they needed it, too. Yeah, I, I really appreciated that. Even after seeing Orglis and Hungry, Hungry drop down and eliminate a squad, they didn't go, all right, let's pile in there. They waited. They sat up top because they were like, well, the game's coming here, so you are too if you want to win it. And just sh shot down, shut down yet another team. Really great win for Vex. And it means that nobody else gets bonus points this game because Rora and Uain both didn't win, so... <laughs> that is very true, and I think they Vex was also in 15th, if I can recall correctly, before that game. So when I say that they needed it, they definitely needed it, especially in that second to last game on World's Edge before we dive into our final game here for Mia. And now that we're on World's Edge, we are go we are going to see a very different play style. I want to take a look back at this game because while contests are important, we did see ultimately a lot of teams being whittled down to just one person, avoiding being completely thirsted while at the same time not giving themselves a whole lot of options. And a lot of this happened on rotation because as much as the, the fight off drop mattered, teams like Made in Heaven were constantly looking for angles and Exo Clan from up on high got to be the beneficiary of their initial drop and their quick rotation into countdown and not lo lose out on members like we saw say LVH do as they tried to make the late rotate in. In, in this in this vein as well, beautiful timing for Vex to come in on this. Another great shot off the Sentinel from Babylon's. He's using it more like a shotgun than anything else. The Sentinel <laughs> is a close range weapon for Babylon's and I'm not sure that should be working. 
I'd actually be terrified that just destroyed me so close here. And Vamo couldn't having to fight for their life on their rotate. You talk about how difficult it'd be, especially when you don't really have anything to work with, like a cat wall. You have the smokes, but you're very limited compared to the cat wall that's up for a few seconds while Orglis and Hungry clean up what was left below their feet. It was Exo Clan here that took some of that distraction away before Vex had come in to clean up what was left of Exo when they made that rotate. Give me, the, give me the sentinel shot. It's gonna happen. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Right there. And another one. This is the Babylon's highlight reel. <laughs> it was sentinel gaming at the end. Really, really. I, and I'd say typically underutilized weapon as well. Since we have so many 3030s in the lobby, typically. Now that we're getting to see perhaps a different weapon take the spotlight, at least for Babylons, makes it look good. This does mean that, of course, with the win, they walk away with plenty of kills on top of this as well. But Orglis and Hungry were not playing a quiet game by any means. No, absolutely not. Look at the comparison right here between Vex and Orglis. They still were able to accrue 9 KP after coming in second. They knew that they were going to be playing for second the moment that they honestly dropped down and gave up that high ground where they didn't take that fight versus Vex. Not knowing if there was a horizon perhaps on that low ground that could gravity lift themselves to third party the fight that would have been inevitable between these two teams. And then looking at Vex's side, yeah, they put in the damage, but Orglis and Hungry basically rounding it off with a thousand more damage that they put in. And they just had such an active position in this ring. Orglis and Hungry took control of the south hub in Countdown. And from there on, we're managing a lot of their threats. You'll notice that Vex didn't initially push them, instead waiting to get a little bit more space. Nobody wants to fight Orglis and Hungry close range because they chewed through teams. Totaling to 16 points this game, they do land just behind Vex, but it's going to be a good game for both teams. Made in Heaven even cannot feel bad about that, especially with the way that they were forced to play from the outside of Countdown. Nice looking right now all the way down. Alliance sitting in eighth place. I'm currently interested to see what's on that second page here. We see UAIM also down there. We saw Aurora actually falling pretty early. You can see over in 14th place. So yeah, that back-to-back -back unfortunately scraped off the table here. We have to see if they have enough points overall, if they could get any extra bonus points. But I'm looking all the way down to Phoenix Legacy, a team that had gotten second place in that last game, unfortunately falling into 19th early in this game. Yeah, this one is, of course, a difficult zone for them because Phoenix Legacy does rely on getting into a good position earlier, a lot like Famo Carrer wanted to and ultimately did during the mid game. Now they still land themselves, Famo Carrer, in the top three with LVH and U Aim standing above them. But it is so extraordinarily close. And even Aurora, who have won two games themselves, haven't made it all the way to second. LVH and VQ are just too consistent. Wow, it's still so close though for this top five. Look at this, even all the way down to Lucite de France holding 40 points. They have one pop-off game that we know they're capable of. They'll skyrocket and find themselves within the top two, perhaps, seeing how Vamakadir is going to play into that next circle. I'm expecting it to be a lot slower, but we'll have to see with the teams that know where they're standing, especially the teams on the second half, if they need to play a little bit more aggressively, if they want to get the points that they need to be in the top 10. Yeah, because like you say, this is the final game that's coming up, and it's where we typically see a lot of the aggression unleashed, where this time we saw picks off on rotations, not a whole lot of teams chasing down to actually finish those kills. Game six, every single point matters, and we will see chase downs. We will see teams hoping that they can come out on the better end of a lot of the risks that they'll ultimately end up taking. I'm also hoping that we get a bit of a different look at the zone because it's been fascinating to see two very different ways to play World's Edge, and I'd like to insert a third into there, especially because rotations are so impactful, as we just saw with Phoenix Legacy. We're going to have to see how all that plays out. We got one last game underway for you guys on World's Edge. Don't go anywhere. We got some more Apex Legends action for you.
Welcome back, everyone, to the ALGS Amiya Edition here. I'm Vicky Kitty. I'm joined with Dia. And Dia, we've had some crazy action, consistency from a lot of teams, whether it be on World's Edge or Storm Point. But now we are down to our final game of the day. We, we have seen, as you say, a lot of consistency, and that's been the standout for me. Teams like VQ, who are constantly getting themselves into zone LVH and Made in Heaven, who after a difficult start, have moved their way back into a top contender, placing in the top three during last map. There is just one game, as you say, left, however, and this is where we'll get a lot of things a lot of questions answered first of all who's going to walk away with the first place in today's games but also after this game it's the end of the first round robin we'll have a much clearer idea of who are from a factual standpoint from a statistical backing the best teams in emea yeah, I mean, if you take a look at the top five of the overall standings for both B and C currently, UAIM heads the way with 54 points, LVH right behind them with 46. So seeing how that's going to play out all the way to Vamokere with 43, it's incredibly tight here for this top five. And there's only one game left to determine how these teams have been able to do within their respective groups. As the dropship goes on forward, we are going to be moving from north to south in this particular game, which means the teams that land over by Climatizer teams like Aurora are going to have a much faster time to rotate than other squads that land south, like, say, Alliance. Alliance, who we have touched on quite a few times today, haven't been having the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day that they had in the first set of games, but this isn't their dream either, and neither is it LVHs as they escape down onto the low ground, if only briefly, briefly with Aftermath chasing them. Always Aftermath going for these 50-50s here. Already trying to take advantage with a Rampage finding Hanzo. He's going to try to crawl away here, but Flash having that advantage with the EVA 8, going to be able to get some extra loot if he can, and it's going to be the PK in his hands while looking at what is left of the opposing squad inside of that, that middle building. It is going to be difficult to siege this, and remember, as well Aftermath should, that there was a third party that came in last time from Made in Heaven. So you will have to approach this silently and quickly in order to get the last two KP. It may, in fact, be better for Aftermath to move on, given the information they already have. But defensive gravity lift on the inside, and Aftermath are showing no signs of giving ground. Taking a look at where the circle is going to be pulling to with these other 50-50s going down here. Now, as Aftermath is going to be able to move away, we see Aftermath not going to be able to give this up just yet as a duo. I mean, it's easy peasy for them. Got to go for the little tactical crouches, make a statement here as Aftermath are on their last game. And, uh, you know, last game previous on game number five, it didn't work out in the best way for them. So now as we take a look at where this next circle is going to be pulling after they're done with their fight, having that ring console available to them, we're moving all the way down to the middle, so slightly shifting away from our last final circle over in Countdown. I like it. It's not a totally different look. In fact, it's just somewhere in between the two zones. And so a lot of our rotations will be similar to what we saw in game one. Take, for example, Phoenix Legacy, who have made their way up from Geyser, but this time are taking an evac tower to lengthen that rotation and make it, I'd imagine, somewhere into Monument. This is a difficult zone to call, as it'll likely pull over by, in fact, where Vex is standing right now. They do want to sit at least in that southern building from Monument. It could allow Phoenix Legacy to call where that next circle is going to be pulled and give them a better rotation point if they want to go for a 50-50 rotation and decide whether they want to rotate up on the train tracks for a later circle or try to navigate around through the choke closer to Grandma's house. We'll see that later as we tune into Yuima, our number one team right now in this lobby. Seeing as they're going to be able to loot up Landslide and see where that circle is going to be pulling, they have the Replicator right there to work with if ExoClan give them any trouble. UAM would really like to stay in control of this lobby, but especially as we set zones like this that are going to be a little bit more chaotic, it's difficult to predict. I love the spot that Phoenix Legacy have set themselves up in, though. As we said, chaos will reign, but a spot like this, while it may not look good on paper, when you have a Watson to back you up, can give Phoenix Legacy a lot more autonomy than any other team in their position loot-wise. 
And that's why I love that their game plan with this composition is try to get to that position as quickly as you can, especially for this final game, and just sit pretty. Yes, you're denying yourself loot, but you're out of the trouble that the Forge is currently in as they get wiped out in this lobby. So La Vista, the Forge is infinite, is going to be able to walk away with some of that extra KP. And they're not going to be moving out from here, too. We can expect this circle to get heavily congested, especially over by Monument, where there's a lot of buildings for teams to coincide in. This also means that ring consoles are coming at a premium because as much as you want to get into this zone early, having a little bit of extra data as to whether it pulls hard monument, whether we're going a little further towards landslide and harvester is going to make all of the difference. And teams like, say, ESG, I think, who rotate from the south, Alliance, who rotate from the south, will have a better chance of running into ring consoles on their rotation. Though they may not get a spot in zone, they'll have an informational advantage over the teams that have chosen by loot or just by happenstance to bunker down early. Yeah, I'm actually really happy that you call that out too, because whether it be staging or landslide, there may not be a replicator over in staging. There's actually one in landslide like we saw before, but it's mm -hmm. with that rotation that allows them to call their next move as we tune into Vex who are hanging out by the choke that we saw chaos in for our game number four. But with only no days off making that rotate from Harvester, they could wait here for right now before they may be inevitably pinched in this situation. There is some natural cover that they could work off of, but this could be third party central for the teams rotating from the south side or even the east side. Yeah, well, I don't like holding this position because it looks like suffering as you say easily besieged <laughs> for vex it's also a, a zone ending B zones mm. have ended here before they end very frequently on the train tracks right above them and if vex can hold on to the spot they'll be in a great position but they're gonna have to deal with other teams much like stay healthy do at the moment uh, their move not nearly as successful as they get very quickly taken down by Aftermath. Cold come in right behind that. Aftermath have made short work of a squad, but now the test is can they reset in time? I'm getting a feeling of deja vu right now. The same third party and even with a slight different timing coming in from Cold as they move in. Looking at Aftermath run away for their lives, getting out of that vault as the EMP has been unleashed. We know that has to be Phoenix Legacy on the other side. Orvis and Hungry are fighting for this building. They need a space to play, and fortunately for them, a conduit ult secures the first floor. Orglis and Hungry can technically share space. It's difficult to push onto a Watson up above them, but... There's a world where Orglis and Hungry actually sit next to Phoenix Legacy, who would also love to avoid a fight. That's why they're just going to wait and, I guess, share this building with them being above them until one of these teams get into a better position to entry frag. But I'm not expecting that happening anytime soon. That's just welcoming a third party, especially if these cat walls get broken down. They're going to be sharing this here for quite some time. All Made in Evan and Infinite do the same thing, but they're trying to get into some of these different angles. And if anything, Phoenix Legacy could just farm them for Evil Shield Charge with the Crypto EMP. I, I am just looking at Orglis and Hungry and wondering what is going on. They're getting so aggressive, and I want to hear it from their perspective. Let's jump into a listen in with Orglis and Hungry. Don't go down, don't go down, pick up. Full fucking plane. Whoever that person is that knocks I love you, bro. I pay fucking love you. Dollars, baby. Let's go, boys. Our game. Watch out this window, yeah? Watch out all the windows. Oh. Yeah. Someone just needed us. I know, it was me. It was me. My spike. I was. We just hold this now, clean everyone down here. There is a reason this team is ecstatic. Taking that fight should not have been allowed by the teams around them by any means. But Orglis and Hungary get away with stealing one of the best spots in Monument right now, taking out the team right above them, getting 3kp, and in the last game, Vicky, where, as we said, points come at a premium. There's very limited opportunity for you to pick those up. And that's a team that's in fifth, by the way, which is important to highlight, considering that Phoenix Legacy was in 13th right before that game had started here, too. So Orgus and Hungry now finding themselves with 40 points right behind Aurora, who have 42 points, have found themselves in a great building to hold for this final circle. I love hearing the comms of the pop-off. They are feeling themselves now after taking that fight, like you mentioned, and three extra KP and placement points on top of it all. Now, looking also at the teams that are taking their time to rotate playing more so 
by the edge. You mentioned Alliance before. They can go through staging because Harvester actually has the replicator and the ring console for them to work with, as well as probably a slower rotate that they would feel safer with, depending on where the other squads rotating out of Lava Siphon may go. On the other end of the map, Aurora have done a very similar thing, approaching through Epicenter with both crafting and both beacons. But Aftermath, they've been the team to watch in this last game, already having taken out two squads. They've got a total of five kills so far, but Aftermath have been taking every single engagement after some disappointing later games for themselves on Stormpoint. They're still using what this squad was built to do. This squad was built to kill other teams. With that composition, that's how you have to play, especially with the Horizon. You put yourself in the better spot and you allow the rest of your team to int on another squad if you have nobody else to worry about around you. And they are staring at 202 over on the other side of Fragment. Well, more of these teams here on the north side of Monument. That's going to be you aim looking to also try to rotate from that north side. Um, okay, it is taking their time moving in from the northeast side with ESG taking this fight over by this hilltop. They're trying to gatekeep this team, but wrapping around on the other side, you have to imagine whether it be an evac tower or a Valkult, since we've seen two already in the lobby thus far, you have to worry about how some of these teams are going to go for this rotate. They're just taking the walk over in front of ESG. I think that's cold actually making that rotate before they try to get to the east side of that circle. They have to think about 202 and Aftermath that are currently there too. And the high ground here does matter quite a bit. It's giving Light the opportunity to reset, even as Cold start to make quite a bit of damage stick. So much, in fact, that Cold are starting to move back in, not rotating towards Monument, instead confident that they can take the fight up against ESG. Tyler, the one that's going to have to open things up for the team on Bangalore, does so with a nice bit of early damage. But a catalyst wall to block their path means that Cold get to make use of this corridor that they've created in front of them and try and get ahead of ESG. Tyler is breaking it down, running for his life between the cat wall, the spikes below him, getting pinged from the other team, and here comes Graceful with the entry frag. Already putting in a lot of pressure. JMW using those temporary shields, though, unfortunately gets taken down immediately right afterwards. Graceful getting beamed. Tyler, though, to help clean up what is left as a squad right it. below them. He's nice. got it. ESG get eliminated. And side by side, while that was happening, Aftermath now trying to take advantage of TO2, perhaps, that were trying to take some shots at the team that was right in front of them. And for both teams, Conduit being able to Radiant Transfer before going down changes everything. Aftermath are going to get third-partied after that. This likely going down even as they run from the remaining members of 202. But Radiant Transfer continuing after Catalyst gets knocked changes the fight for Cold, makes them able to stay in the fight for just a little bit longer. And for 202, now that they've been able to take over the buildings in Monument, it's likely that we see these two squads clash next, Cold and 202. Now this works out with Aurora being right in front of them, looking at Orglis and Hungry. They'll hear that fight go down once that next circle starts closing in the next less than 20 seconds. Aurora with the ping, they know they are right there ahead in the distance. 202 maybe be looking to cross through that zip here, but they will not be able to get the chance. Well, the fight inside the tunnel by Lionside is going down here. It's Exo versus Go Next with Dex keeping them in their sights from right behind who have not moved from that non name POI. Disruptor Alternator does hurt quite a bit. Bambino takes a quick reset. Sikashi pushes up to try and finish off a kill. G7 oh. hipfire should do the job. Two more bullets sunk into this will do it. But the movement on the other side is just too good. Young Hong Kong does go down with Bambino having fallen as well. You have to imagine that Vex are just off screen waiting for their chance to third party. Mexi going to slide in, try and finish off this kill. Does so. Exo Clan are down. And Vex do not push this even after the extended fight. They're just taking shots from a distance. It sounds like a wingman that they were able to acquire here without trying to overextend because the moment they do move from that spot, easily another team could just take that from them. I know Cold was rotating in that area, so probably also looking at Vex while Aurora on top of the train tracks looking directly at Cold now, moving all the way back, trying to get into a better spot for this next circle rotate. Now that they have that information, they also get the scan over by the care pack that has the Prowler calling out any team that may have that weapon once they approach from that direction.
it's a smart play from Aurora to retreat back down onto the low ground because from here, they are gods of Monument. If they push up to Cold, they are no longer that. They are just mortals going up against Cold on even or lower ground. If Aurora can just push Cold away and into Vex, Aurora can kill teams like No Days Off, 202, even try their luck against Orglis and Hungry. So I like that they've moved back down because everybody's setting themselves up for the next zone, the ring to come, because so many of our teams will have to leave Monument at this point. It's going to be a bloodbath. There is about five teams that are going to be rotating from this side of the circle, and they have less than 30 seconds to make those move. 13 squads left, and UAIM is stuck in the thick of it. They're looking at Lucita Fonts. Made in Heaven is inside the building of Monument, and Infinity is inside, Infinite rather, is inside the southern building from Monument. So while they get to take a look at the teams that are going to fight their way into the edge of the circle, they have to also watch their backs like Vamos Carrera and Orglis and Hungry. You aim just a few seconds left. It looks like they're aiming to get onto the high ground to the western side of Monument. Currently, as you say, gate kept by LCDF. Alliance lies in front of both of these teams, playing in the open territory. Alliance, who with one match win, could change the story of today for themselves. Max Drake takes quite a bit of damage, but UAM still have safety provided to them by the wall, allowing them to bypass very nearly the rest of Monument. One goes down, Max Drake is out, and you cannot recover Max at this point. The ring just hurts too darn much. Yeah, you just got to keep running for it right now. Sonya fighting for their life. While Made in Heaven is taking Chateau Le Cite de France, Infinite is right there. That was the fight by the edge of the circle that I was waiting to see. And guess who got whiff of an advantage point? It's going to be Vavo Querer, who are also moving underneath those train tracks. You aim with Sonya still alive is inside the next circle. Turning around just barely to watch LCDF. Psychop oh, oh. and Izidane moving up behind them and some nice shots from the high ground on a Kiner will take them down. Izidan commits onto the low ground. LCDF want to run the north side of this zone, but Catalyst Wall does cut them off. Go next. Do fall on their exit from Landslide. And on the south side of the zone, where Vex previously held, we've got another fight for the top. LCDF continue pushing in on low ground. Cold goes down. LCDF open up massively with Izidan cracking three people. This has to be their fight on low ground, even though it's just Izidan committing to it. They are just breaking everything down from that side of the circle, too. And it was because they were at least contested moving from the west side of where that next circle was pulling versus the teams that have to exit out of Monument. Great position for them to be in as one of the members of Lucita Font are still inside that next circle. And Aurora with Oi Rain in a little bit of trouble looking to restabilize here, finding themselves in some tr trouble. Ardeki's going to be able to loot as well. He's got the wingman in hand and playing off this low ground made in heaven get eliminated. It's Lucite de France that are taking so much space in that northern circle. Ardeki starts moving in. Remember, Aurora, if they should win this game, as they are so close to doing, would get an extra point. Would be, at this point, the most winningest team in EMEA for this split. And they can take that momentum right now, but with Alliance looking down on them, with LCDF looking down on them, it is a literal and metaphorical hill to climb. LCDF have the biggest attention off of Alliance. As much as they're trying to look down at Aurora, Alliance know that Lesitas de France are likely the largest threat to their game win. It's a fact that when the world needed Alliance the most, They've come and they've conquered, holding on to that high ground. They have the positional advantage here, and it's like you mentioned, Aurora being that threat over on the other side, as well as Cecil de France looking to try to fight their way from that north side, though. Aurora's the one that's on that low ground, but they do have some natural cover to work with in this next circle. It's so little, but with the amount of space between them and Alliance, it's natural for Alliance to focus them. LCDF could actually move into third party and engagement, an engagement that Aurora do not want to happen, but that Alliance simply must make work. LCDF are going to be taking space on the other side of this, while Oi Rain just tries to keep Alliance at a distance. Good beams through no the way. smoke, but is it enough? They're going on the push. Aurora do not want to take this lying down, and Oi Rain jumps up on the gravity lift now, desperately trying to disengage his hard deck. He goes down. Has it been enough? LCDF start to push up on Alliance. Aurora want to turn this around. Want a third party afterwards. And with it is it down. Alliance commit to the fight. Oh, 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 oh. 
<laughs> they do because listen to fronts. They had no other choice. Now it's only up to Psycop. Every single time a team tries to push onto Alliance, they get shut down. Now it's to a duo and a rat left for these other two squads that aren't Alliance who are up and alive as a full three man. They were able to get the res though onto Hardeki. So if they can restabilize though and get an extra KP, that's going to be Aurora trying to reset. Aurora with all three members back up, but still on the low ground. Want their third win. Alliance desperately want their first. The team that everyone has said nay to in year four might still be able to take this, but Aurora, what will they do with their low ground position? Hardeki is so split from the squad. Impulse and Oirain are so incredibly low. The three timers here? Trying to find a way around the rock, trying to take different angles while Knight Impulse holds one side with the Digi. Destroying the piercing spikes at the same time while Alliance are going to have to move from that pride rock in front of them. Aurora want to claim the crown, but Alliance need to keep it in their hands. The kings of EMEA from last split may still retake it. Impulse and Oirain are down. It's just Hardeki, and Hardeki can't do it alone. Alliance do reclaim the crown, and just at the end of the first round, Robin. It was just enough damage at the very end. Hockey's in effect, finishing off with 4 KP each, leaving them at 9 KP with Yuki being that finisher here. Alliance needed that win. They get the dub and they get the KP necessary to stay in the conversation. That is a great way to end the day. Watching Alliance reclaim, even if it is just by one game, should be enough not just for them but for their fans that have been sitting silently holding their breath for the past three days of play it's just the fact that they were now able to sit close to the top five probably six after their last previous game that was something that they needed and it's perfect because we were able to open up the pre-show hearing Aki's thoughts on how alliance was going to move forward after having a pretty lackluster first day and here they are a little quiet at the start but right when you needed it on world's edge they get the dub in a very intense situation too after aurora tried to go for a reset Let's take a look back at this game as well, because Alliance were not the focus. They were not the team that was in the middle of everything, taking every fight. So many of our other squads, as you and I have postulated, Vicky, chose instead to make this the game where they would commit to everything. We had so many engagements taking place way outside of the ring. And for Oracles and Hungry, who were gutsy enough to do it, even inside the ring actually insane An alliance here we saw that made the rotate over to harvester there was a ring console there and a replicator so once he took that fight they also felt confidence when they were able to make that rotate away from harvester into the spot that you saw cold in trying to take more of these fights it was a lot of these congestion points where we saw go next also try to take this fight the catwall going up vex sitting on the other side of that tunnel entrance well even though this fight did last a little bit long this was a tough rotation point for the teams they were forced to leave out of that west side of the map I like predicting Monument in theory because if it goes there, at least you've got a building. And it's a lot easier of a spot to hold than what teams like Vexed and Go Next were trying to do. But man, did we see how much it can pay off to sit on the outside of the ring in a slightly riskier position for teams like Alliance who were not holding any real space. Through Harvester, they jump straight into the outside of Monument where there is no cover outside of the natural cover that you talked about with these rocks. Aurora played a very similar game, moving their way up along the ridge line, contesting against Cold, moving down to clean up squads from Monument. They tried their darndest, but they did not achieve the three wins on the day. Alliance sweep that away with a 9 kill, 21 point finish in first place. I love that that was shut down for each of the teams that I got in two wins today as well. UAIM, Aurora, even to the very end. Alliance finishing first with 9 KP is what you like to see. Even all the way down with Aurora finishing with 3 KP, playing a little bit safe, more by the edge as they usually do. But let's see if their fonts were out here fragging Dia. Even to the very end, the way that they were snapping for the teams that were leaving out of Monument, they still were able to stay alive and try to secure the KP that they could before trying to push onto Alliance, meeting their do. LCDF are absolutely our silent killers, but let's take a look at the bottom half of this lobby before moving to our overall points, because you aim while they started strong, you called it out, did have a much weaker 
World's Edge as anticipated. Well, they may have wowed people on Storm Point, it's very clear that there is a disconnect between these two lobbies. Yeah, taking a look at what we had here in store, I can't wait to see what the series results are. And there you go, you aim stays on top. Wow. But so close. Look at the slight gap between you and Aurora holding on to 54 points. Nasita Fonts with 52, even all the way down to LVH Alliance. I mean, it was always very close, but this top 10 in general, going down to even Vex, is just insane to see how close and skilled this entire lobby was to one another. LCDF, though, really my team to watch coming out of today. Or rather, I guess not watch, because they seem to be so much more powerful off screen. They take on so many teams in awkward positions, and for some weird reason, they're always coming out on top. <laughs> also want to highlight Phoenix Legacy, of course, also placing in 15th. We were talking a little bit about them yesterday, but unfortunately went down very early in that final game. A lot of action to break down, and what better person to join us than Rain Day? Talk a little bit about your thoughts after we just concluded our sixth and final game for the day. Well, it was a great game five and game six. You kind of set the tone, Vicky, with this is what teams now are working with. They know what they need to do to win, and it ended up being in game six about four teams that could have won. I mean, if Orglis and Hungary had kept the pace up that we saw them have after winning that fight in Monument, they, they could have gotten another 15 points. There were still 10 teams alive, and that's a ton of placement points plus a ton of kills. That ended up going down, but fourth is a great finish for them. Really, though, the teams that always were at the top of the list today, it was Vamo Career finding themselves in second places, but really second place in the leaderboards were Aurora and you aim. I mean, it started off with game four as we walked back through that final circle where there were a ton of other teams who had opportunities to seize the moment. We saw fighting over here on this slope and you saw in Geyser as well, Phoenix Legacy getting involved, but who would show up? It would be Aurora to kind of play spoiler for this, but it didn't leave without giving us some good moments from Alpha Draft, Sabs, Kyrie of really seeing that the potential this squad has did they get a little over aggressive a little excited that's something that we'll have to wait and see they'll look at it in vods and say maybe we could have stayed on our height but you can see the zone pushing them in where do you go you can wrap left and fight aurora straight up but i think the positioning the kills the fight they were already involved in kind of means that this is a very straightforward fight you try to just at least get kills here there's three people who aren't even looking at you saps pops off with the 30 30 they end up getting it in hardeki with the arc star comes in late as well as the rest of aurora and they clean things up but as we casted that really vicky i want to lead it into you and then dia game five that was that pivotal swing teams could have done it but obviously you know only certain teams step up in big moments I mean, in moments where uh, you got the Senti charged up, hitting your face, destroying your heavy stacked Evo, um, it's scary. Babylon's popped off with the Iron Sights on the Senti, amped up. Every single time we tuned into Babylon's, he was destroying shield after shield after shield. I feel like it was a highlight clip of just his Senti shots alone for this end circle. But it was also the pressure that they put down on the team that was in the inside. They saw that they were going to get pushed on by Vex and decided to play for second. That's why they gave up this high ground here in this position. Once kind of got hit with another Senti shot, he was like, all right, you got that. They dropped down, they played for second. They want to get the KP necessary, deny that from Vex. And then Vex was able to clear the way for what was left of that team and then take the dub. Yeah, this was, as you say, just a real game of pressure and option limiting. Vex did that really well, and Orglis and Hungry weren't just able to catalyst while their way out of it, as so many teams have done in final circles. In our last moments of the sixth game, though, the 3v3 was one that Aurora were going into disadvantage, and yet I want to applaud the way they played it. Very few times did they actually full heal. To be teams like Aurora tend to want to play a little bit safer, sit back and say, all right, well, I'm full HP, now I'm going back in. That did not happen. Oirene and Impulse are swinging this with most of their health collectively missing as Hardecki finally gets to rejoin the fight. Aurora navigate the low ground to the point that this was a lot closer than it had any right to be. And as much as I applaud Alliance for their win, I wouldn't say that Aurora are out of this just yet. The Assassins could still come back to kill the Kings.